Can I welcome you all to the Development Committee? I'm Councillor Filmer, I'm Chairman of the Committee. Just at this point, I'll particularly welcome, as well as the members of the public, Councillor Haywood, welcome to the Committee. It's your obviously your first committee with us since you've had your full training, so I hope you'll find it as an enjoyable committee as the, as the rest of the members do. It's uh, it's never dull, um, so hopefully you'll, if there's any questions, do feel free to ask as, as things go on. Just to, uh, to for, for members of the public who are present as well, uh, this is a hybrid meeting today, which basically means we're both operational within the canal side uh, building, uh, but we're also working through the Teams system online so that both members of the public, officers and other councillors can join us virtually and don't have to be within the room. So there will be a, a little delay at points because we need to make sure the microphones get to members so that they can be heard through the computer as well as in the room itself. Uh, the, the format of the meeting today is basically uh, as per your agenda that you'll have, have seen that's been published and the officers' presentations can be found on the, uh, the council website uh, for those who are online. We'll take each application in turn. Uh, the, out, the officers will outline the applications before us. Uh, we'll then ask the members of the public to step forward if there are speakers uh, to address us. Uh, then members will debate and ultimately decide those applications that are are coming before us. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes just for those of you mainly who are in the room. Um, there's no planned fire drill this morning, so in case of alarms going off, then they are the real thing. Uh, there are exits to the rear of the room and to the side if you uh, follow the signs. Uh, if you require toilet facilities during this morning's uh, meeting, they are through the, the central doors at the, at the rear of the room. If you need to have a drink, there are there is water on the side of the room with with glasses that you can uh, can have. And if I could ask all members present and members of the public, if you can make sure if you've got a mobile phone with you that you've definitely got it turned to silent, or ideally if it can be turned off, that would be would be better so it doesn't interfere with the the sound systems. Just to introduce uh, those who who are uh, with us today, uh, as I say, there are some officers and members who are within the room, uh, there are others who are online. So in terms of those who are present in the room, to my to my right are members of the Democratic Services team, uh, Mr. Mel Hewish and Mr. Taylor. To my left, uh, from our planning section, is Mrs. DeVries. Uh, also online, we have uh, Amelia Alve, Liam Evans, Shanta Parsons, uh, Dean Titchener, and we will be joined by Nick Tate, who will all be at times presenting applications to us today. And also online, we have from our legal team, uh, Dawn Lehman, uh, who is here to make sure that we carry out matters in a, in a proper manner. I think that brings us to the, the end of the opening comments, at which point uh, I would just say, before we move on to the, the agenda itself, um, members may well be aware that uh, Lillian Cartwright, who was a long-standing member of this council and a, a long-standing member of this committee, uh, has passed away. And I would ask if you are able uh, to stand, if we could have a one-minute silence uh, just before we start the full committee. So thank you very much. <laughs> Right, if we move to our agenda that's before us today, item one on the agenda is the apologies for absence. Mr. Mark Hewish, do we have any apologies for this morning, please? Uh, yes, Chairman. Apologies from Councillor Scott and Councillor Betty. Thank you very much. All other members 
Uh, and then move to item two, uh, which is the minutes of which we have a, a bumper session today. So if we take them one at a time, um, the first set of minutes that you have to confirm whether they are true and accurate record are those of the 30th of March. Are there any uh, amendments that any members have to those minutes? If not, I'm looking for a proposal that they're a true and accurate record. That's Councillor King and Councillor Bolt seconded. All those in favour, please show. That's clearly carried. So if we move on to the next set of minutes, which were those for the 27th of April. Again, are there any amendments? If not, again, can I have a proposal and a seconder, Councillor King and Councillor Revens? All those in favour that we sign those as well. That's clearly carried. Then we move to the 25th of May. Again, any amendments? In which case, can I have a proposal that are true and accurate record, Councillor Revens and Councillor Bolt? All those in favour that we sign them? Thank you. Then we move to the 1st of June. Again, any amendments? I'm looking for a proposer and a seconder, Councillor Kingham and Councillor Grimes. All those in favour that we sign them? Thank you. We then move to the 22nd of June. Again, any amendments? Can we have a proposer and a seconder? Councillor Pierce and Councillor Revens, I think. So those in favour, we sign them. That's clearly carried. And then to the 20, I say it's going 20th of July. Uh, any amendments? In which case those, a proposer and a seconder, please. Councillor King and Councillor Grimes, overall in favour that we sign them, please show. That's clearly carried. Thank you very much. So we will get those signed a little later, otherwise I could be going for a while here. So thank you very much. We'll move on then to item three, which is urgent business. I've not been advised that there is any urgent business that isn't already covered on our agenda this morning. Uh, item four is public speaking time. For members of the public, uh, some of you are present in the room, some are, are online. Um, when Just to, to let you know, the, the format we'll follow is we'll get to your application, we'll take them each in turn, the officers will give the background and detail of the application, and then I'll ask the speakers either to come to the speaker's table or to enable their microphone online. Uh, you then have three minutes to address the committee uh, with your comments on the application. Uh, what we will do is um, we will let you know when there is one minute of that time left to go. Uh, I think, Mr. Mohiris, you've got a, uh, a stopwatch that we will be counting down. So once we get to that minute to go, we will give you that warning. And then if you can obviously draw your comments to a close within that time, that would be most appreciated. If we move then on to item five, which is the decorations of interest. Uh, are there any decorations that members have on today's business? We'll start with Councillor Facey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, application on page 115. Uh, this is within the parish of Burnham and Hybers, Chairman, uh, which I'm a member, but I do not attend planning meetings, Chairman, and I've had no prior uh, discussions with any member of the council relating to this application. Thank you. Three. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, items page one one five and one two four both burn on one C. I don't know the people and have no conversation with anybody. Thank you. Not seeing anyone else on that side. So come to Councillor Murphy. Is it on? It is on. Um, I'd just like to repeat that uh, it's actually the same. I'm a Highbridge councillor and a Sedgemoor district, Burnham's North councillor, so I, I, exactly the same. To make a couple of decorations because uh, the application's on page 108, uh, 93 and 132 are all within my uh, my ward. Um, but again, although I've attended the parish council, I've not taken any part in the discussion on the planning matters at those meetings and therefore have not predetermined the applications. Uh, for, for members of the public, it's important that obviously if members do have an involvement in a planning application that um, that is declared at the start of the meeting, the, the decorations you've heard today are basically those of, uh, that are described as non-predetermination. So we have a, a standing order within this committee which basically says members can either get involved at the parish and town council level or they can be involved at the district council level. The concern is that if they're involved at the town and parish 
and they've been involved in the decision making, then it would, might be perceived that they've already made their mind up before they come to the committee. So that way, by them not having any involvement at the town and parish, then they can come to this meeting with an open mind and have not committed themselves one way or other on application and therefore have not made not predetermined that application before it comes to us today. If we move then on to uh, item six on the agenda, which is the planning applications themselves, and we'll go to the first application where we have speakers present, and that is on page 108, and we're within the parish of Brent Knoll. And uh, if I could ask this one to be introduced, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, um, this application relates to the erection of an agricultural building on land to the south of Hafford, uh, which is on Wick Lane between Brentnell and Limpsham. We move on to. Yeah, OK, so this is the application location here. Um, the site itself is an existing paddock to the south of the property, which is here. There are a couple of outbuildings to the rear or within the rear parking area, uh, which is to the north of the building. And as you can see, within the general area, there are a number of agricultural and domestic buildings, as well as residential properties uh, within the locality. The site itself is bounded on the west side by Wick Lane and on the east side by the railway line, and is enclosed by existing tree planting and hedgerows. The site itself is outlined in red on this plan here. Uh, so we have the primary residence here belonging to the applicants. Uh, who have a small holding at the moment. They have a small number of uh, livestock and a uh, small amount of land holding, which they are looking to expand. And as part of that expansion, they're looking to erect this new proposed building within the location shown here. The existing access would be used to provide access for the building uh, and to the paddock to the south um, and would be used for the storage of machinery, implements and dry feed. This is the elevation. These are the elevations and floor plans of the proposed building. Uh, so the building itself is to be 5.24 metres in height to the ridge and will be clad in box profile sheeting uh, coloured green. Uh, the building itself will have three bays, each of which will be accessed by roller shutter doors with a pedestrian access door to the both the north and south gable elevations. This is the site. Um, as viewed from Wick Lane. So this is the existing access into the paddock with half of the dwelling located here. Um, and Wick Lane goes, this is this is in a northerly direction uh, with the application site here. The proposed building will be positioned along this boundary here in the background here. With the railway line just beyond on the other side of this uh, line of trees and hedgerows. This is a view looking further towards the south east corner of the of, of the paddock uh, and as you can see it's fairly consistent in terms of vegetation along that boundary uh, it screens the head it screens the railway line from wick lane um, and this planting to the front here is uh, adjacent to wick lane This is a further view looking back further south along Wick Lane, but towards Hafford here and the location of the building will be in this area here. It's considered based upon the materials proposed and the scale and height of the building that the existing landscaping within the area will provide suitable screening for the development from wider vantage points. While there will be views from Wick Lane itself, it is not considered that the scale and materials of the building will lead to a significant visual impact on the surrounding area. It's considered the building itself is also of a, of a size and scale which is appropriate for its function as well. This uh, is a view taken from within the site uh, which shows recent tree planting that has been uh, has been planted along Wick Lane. Uh, this has been subject to land drainage consent as well, uh, just emphasises the uh, landscaping proposed uh, with a view to providing mitigation measures uh, and further integrating the building with the surrounding landscape. Uh, the planning recommendation is subject to a condition that uh, requires the submission of a formal landscaping scheme uh, and this is considered to be a suitable approach to integrating the building with the wider landscape. 
overall it's considered that the proposed development is of an appropriate scale and designed for its intended use uh, to allow the applicants to expand their existing agricultural activities um, and will do so without having a negative impact on the amenity of nearby properties or the wider landscape. In terms of the recommendation, there, are, are a, there is a, an amendment proposed uh, to the condition related to the agricultural use of the building, uh, rather than referring to the adjoining farmland, is recommended that the agricultural use of the building uh, is more generally tied to the uh, use as agricultural uh, rather than the adjoining farmland in the event that the applicants uh, with their intention to expand the business would allow them to use the building in association with any other land that they acquire uh, in the future. It is also proposed to include a lighting condition requiring any lighting to be installed to be subject to details to be submitted prior to the installation to ensure that there's no negative impact within this rural area. Uh, the recommendation for this planning application is to grant consent. Thank you, Chairman. As you'll see, we have a, a couple of speakers on this application. So if we could start with Mr. Griffith Jones, would you like to come forward? Is that okay if I take off my, my mask? Right. Remind you, you've got the three minutes and you'll be We'll let you know when there's one minute of that time left to go, so start whenever you're ready, please. Well, thank you for allowing me the opportunity uh, to speak at this meeting. Um, I live in Pear Tree Cottage, which is the property directly opposite Hafford, um, across uh, Wick Lane. It's described as a modest agricultural um, enterprise, but it is a very small holding of just over two acres with some chickens, and you saw a picture of the small stall by the gate where there are a couple of boxes of eggs. The application and the report from the planning officer mentions 10 sheep, but the owners have never had any sheep of his on the land since uh, moving in. There is mention of possible acquisition of a further 20 acres. Well, I farm um, sheep locally, and I know all the local farmers well, and they're all looking to expand their enterprises. And I think there is no likelihood of any local land becoming available of any substantial size. This is a, a very large building. It's 60 feet by 30 feet and over 17 feet high, which is about the same size and height as my uh, property um, directly, um, directly opposite. That does not have the appearance of an agricultural building. It looks more like um, an industrial building, which would be more appropriate on uh, an industrial park. And, and I should add that there is a business that is being run, uh, a gate business, which is being run from the property um, at the moment. Um, the planning officer says that the scale of the building is appropriate to the size the applicant is seeking to expand to. But you are being asked today to consider an application for a holding of just over two acres, not of over 20 acres. This building would be disproportionately large for what is needed uh, for the intended declared use of food and mach machinery storage um, to service just over two acres. This would make it necessarily unreasonably obtrusive with a disproportionate visual impact. And, and, and we feel represents overdevelopment. In terms of residential amenity, the Satomore adapted local plan states that proposals should not unacceptably impact residential amenity of occupants of nearby dwellings. All the three nearest neighbours have raised, raised objection based on the excessive size of the building just by the road and its impact uh, and the way that this will change the nature of a, of a small rural ham, hamlet. So to summarize, the key point we feel is that the size of the proposed building is excessive and unnecessarily large for the declared intended use to service just two, three, eight, two acres. And it will be disproportionate, have a dis. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a, a second speaker, which is uh, Aaron Adams, who is the applicant, and I believe is joining us 
online. If you could make sure that your microphone is is enabled, please. Is, is that? Can you hear me now? Working for us. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. We can we now. Can we now. can we now. Can. Oh, yeah, yeah. We certainly can. So again, just a reminder: you've got the uh, three minutes, and we will let you know when there's a minute of that time left to go. So please start when you're ready. Brilliant. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak during this meeting. Having lived in Somerset a whole life, I think it's fair to say we're locals. I grew up on a busy and thriving small holding that started alongside my father's business, which soon grew to become our family way of life. Since moving to Halford, we have bred and raised over 200 chickens and have sold over 300 fertile eggs online. Four weeks ago, we expanded with new breeding stock. We already have plans to bring our 10 sheep home, venture into the world of breeding and rearing organic free range pork and turkey. Our sheep are currently living at my father's small holding. However, he plans to slow down, meaning we will inherit his farming equipment. We have successfully acquired 20 acres of additional rental land locally to the four acres we currently have at Hafod. We have also actively bid to purchase land locally and will continue to do so. Earlier this year, we harvested 200 quality small bell hay from our four acre paddocks. Without sufficient dry storage, we had no choice but to give it away. In regards to our access previously mentioned having witnessed multiple road blockages and difficulty unloading livestock feed deliveries at mr griffith jones's property opposite we knew it was vital to allow for agricultural deliveries to get off the road and safely unload six months ago we were approached by farm watch this visit reinforced our belief that we need to secure secure our agricultural assets we have trailers being delivered in december we currently have a digger telehandler and are keen to purchase a quad bike our proposal for the agriculture building is to simply allow us to secure our farming equipment without fear of it being stolen, as is proven by the Farm Watch and daily police reports. I believe our application is very simple. It's an agricultural storage building in a rural agricultural area. We believe we have done our utmost to be respectful and considerate to our neighbours in regards to the location. That was previously agreed with Mr Griffith Jones prior to any application. The height, which we've also reduced by 20%, as requested by Mr Griffith Jones, and the green box profile cladding to disguise the building into the evergreen hedging. We have permission from the drainage board to plant fast growing trees along the ditch. These trees have been planted and soon will hide the shed from the roadside. Just to kind of confirm, we are we're an ambitious young family. We're hard working ethic to produce better quality food for ourselves and others around us. We want to educate our young children as they grow and provide ourselves with the best quality life we can. Thanks for your time. Should we try again? Liam, are you able to hear Sorry, us? Sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Asking um, to, to, to Liam, the case officer, was basically obviously there is a justification for this building that's being put forward by the applicant of land and agricultural use. There has been some questions raised about whether that is sufficient to justify this building. Uh, I wonder if you could give us some information on that and also in terms of the condition for agricultural use, what that would limit the use of this building to. Yes, uh, so yes, we, we appreciate the, uh, the, the, uh, the applicant has a small holding at the moment and what we're, what we're seeing in terms of the proposal is, is, a, uh, is a building which we consider to be of an appropriate scale given, given the limited size of, of, of the holding at the moment, although appreciate from what the applicant has just said about expanding uh, and acquiring those 20 acres. Uh, the, the, the trouble I guess we have is that we we would need to see um, or the applicant would 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 would, uh, would want to see some form of secure storage on site to allow them to uh, give that security of knowing that they could exp expand without six significant risk to property and, and, and equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we feel as officers that the, the, the justification has been provided for this rurally based development uh, of the size and scale that has been proposed. In terms of the condition, um, we're, we're basically just trying to uh, give a bit of clarity to the use of the building going forward, uh, because ultimately the building itself is being justified on the agricultural need. Uh, and we feel that an agricultural condition um, limiting its use to agricultural use uh, would give that sort of certainty going forward and, and, and clarity about what the building should be used for. So subject to, to that condition in effect, if, if the building became used for something other than agricultural, then it would be subject to enforcement action? 
Yes, yes. I mean, obviously, we're pending investigation as to whether a breach had actually occurred. But yes, it, what we're trying to seek with the condition uh, that we've set out within the, the report, which we feel is actually slightly restricted in terms of it uh, name checking uh, adjoining farmland. We feel that actually if we ex expand that to allow that to be the building to be used for the additional land that the applicant may acquire in the future, uh, it would allow still the certainty of knowing what the building was used for, but would allow the flexibility for the applicant to actually use it in association with land they'd also acquire as part of their expanding holding. Thank you very much. Councillor Hendry. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good morning, Mr Chairman, councillors. Small holdings like this have to be encouraged to expand. They have to be. That's that's the way forward. That's what people do. And what comes first is either the acquisition of land or the buildings to, to have the machinery and so forth. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg, which one comes first, but that's the way it is too. The building that, that the applicant is asking for is, in my view, how I look at it at this moment, is appropriate. He wants it for dry storage and security of his farm machinery, I guess. So at this moment in time, I can see the man going forward. I can see what they're trying to do. The building's not too bad, con considering what he actually wants it for. So at this moment, fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Kingham. How about that? Is that better? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, this um, obviously has come to committee today on the objections from the parish council, which I'm trying to sort of make sense of the application on the grounds of poor visual amenity, overdevelopment and insufficient ventilation for livestock. Now, looking at the details of the building, I'm not sure they're going to keep livestock in there. So obviously it's given the neighbours a chance to come along and put their views in. And providing we can make sure that this remains what it's actually intended for, then I've got no objections to this application. Any other comments or questions from members? Yes, Councillor Murphy. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm listening to the um, objections from the neighbour across the way, I think they're perfectly valid. I think there's there's two issues here. The first issue is this this quite interesting um, speculation about the development in the future from remote sites, um, which are in conflict with what was originally said. I mean, I I think that to conflict the neighbours with the access and build something that is going to have uh, traffic in and out opposite his his building, I think is 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 a bridge too far. Uh, you're allowing or you're hoping Liam is putting forward a a proposal to build what does not which, which the point made by the the objector was that it was more of an industrial building than an than an than an agricultural building. Uh, so it's actually more of a building for process, <clears throat> not just storage. So I am very suspicious about this um, this application. I think that the objector has a very valid point. He's lived there for a long time. The, I think the uh, parish council has objected and so have all of the people in the area have objected to this because they it is something which is over it's excessive development and I think he's quite right in saying that. So I would I would not support Liam's um, proposal. I would, I would certainly oppose it on those grounds. Yeah, Mrs. De Vries. Um, there are four letters objecting and ten supporting. So it's a little bit unclearly written in that it says there have been 14 received, but four are objecting and ten are supporting. Um, and also is confirmed that it's for agricultural storage, not um, keeping of livestock. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yes, when you look at the map, 
connected to the report. I'm just thinking in terms of agricultural traffic generated. There are three farms on that map in close um, proximity and therefore in, in such a rural area with a, a high high number of farms, you would expect some generation of farm vehicles. And um, I think with the conditions attached to the recommendation, I don't actually have a, a problem with this. It would seem appropriate use for the space and the evidence of need. The need has been established and um, and the, con the uh, controls around, are there, are there sufficient controls around the um, not housing of animals within it? I know it's protected against um, residential and um, for farming purposes, but um, I just wonder if it's protected enough in terms of ventilation and the concerns expressed by the parish council. Could there be any sort of enhancement just to ensure that animals aren't kept there because of the ventilation concerns raised? Um, yeah, I mean, it's proposed to condition three to take out reference to the adjoining land. We can also make reference to not not storing livestock within the building if it provides members some comfort. I think it, it will establish that the use that it's been presented today as the rationale for the building. And with those conditions, I'm happy to propose the officer's recommendation. Just to confirm that is the, the recommendations as in the, the papers, plus the, the lighting condition, the amended condition relating to ensuring it's agricultural use only and that it would not include livestock. Okay. Councillor Kingham. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to second that uh, recommendation, Chairman. Comments or questions from members before we move to a, a vote? Okay, so the recommendation has been moved and seconded to, to grant permission with the amended conditions as outlined in the, in the discussion we've just had. Those in favour of that, please show. And those against? That is all that is clearly carried. So permission is granted with the amended conditions. 12 for one against. Thank you. Right, members, if you could move to the next application where we have speakers present, and that is in uh, Burnham Road Highbridge on page 115. And if I could ask uh, Amelia Elve, if you'd like to present this one for us, please. Sure. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Um, I can see it's on the big screen. But I will just get everything ready and I will start. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Is that... Can you hear me? <laughs> can you hear me? Millie. Yeah. Yep. OK, sorry. I <laughs> just wanted to check before I started. OK, I will start now. Thank you. So the application um, is for retrospective consent for the formation of a new driveway and dropped curb to the front of the property and retrospective consent for the erection of a wall at 36 Burnham Road in Highbridge. This application is before members as the officer's recommendation is contrary to the town council's view. The Town Council are objecting due to concerns relating to highway safety matters as detailed in the report. Since the publication of the report, issues with the dimensions of the verge as depicted in the drawings have been rectified and a further drawing has been provided to show the pedestrian visibility displays. A further condition will also be added to require that the render and coping stones are applied to the wall within three months of the decision if permission is granted. The slide lists the relevant policies from both the local plan and the neighbourhood plan for the area. The main considerations for this application are the impacts on visual and residential amenities, highway safety, flood risk and the historic environment. The application site lies within the town of Highridge to the north of Burnham Road, a B-class road. The application seeks retrospective consent for the creation of a vehicular access onto Burnham Road and the erection of a rendered wall. The site currently benefits from a vehicular access to the rear, accessed by Old Burnham Road. 
The new access is to be tarmacked and a gravel parking area will also be created. A section of tarmac will be placed upon the existing grass verge. The wall will be 1.65 metres high, rendered and with coping stones on top. The existing rear access provides one parking space and the applicant wishes to increase the parking provision at the property. Image one shows the site as viewed on Google Street View in March 2021 prior to any works taking place. Image two is from the officer's site visit on the 1st of July, taken from the southwest of the site. The application site is just to the right of the bus stop. The block work wall is, is to be rendered with the remaining brick section to the right to be removed. Image three shows the site as viewed from the same side of the road to the northwest of the site. Image four has been taken from the corner of the junction with the mini roundabout. And image five is taken from the southeast with the vehicular access created where the pedestrian gate and red brick wall are. Um, here on this slide is a street scene drawing of the wall once completed with the access. The Highways Authority considers standing advice to apply to this proposal and it is considered that the application complies with this. Drawings have been provided to demonstrate that both the relevant vehicular and pedestrian visibility displays required by this advice can be achieved and conditions will be used where relevant to ensure this compliance remains. The new wall has been erected on the site of a pre-existing wall of a similar height. Whilst the previous wall was red brick, the new rendered wall was considered visually acceptable due to the other examples of render in the vicinity. A condition is suggested to require the render and coping stones are in place within three months if consent is granted to ensure that the visual amenity of the street scene is retained. A small section of grass verge is to be lost, however, there is an adequate quantity of soft landscaping, particularly the grassed area to the southeast of the site, thus on balance this is considered to be acceptable. Whilst the neighbouring properties on this side and section of Burnham Road do not have vehicular accesses in this location, opposite the site a number of dwellings have parking areas to the front with accesses onto Burnham Road. The site is in flood zone 3, however the nature of the development is unlikely to increase the flood risk elsewhere. Surface water will be dealt with in accordance with highways requirements as previously outlined. The modest nature of the groundworks required are considered acceptable in terms of potential impact on any archaeological remains. As such, the officer's recommendation is to grant planning permission with conditions to ensure compliance with standing advice as set up by highways and for completion of the wall within three months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a speaker on this, which I have down as uh, Robert Baker, who I believe is joining us online. If you could just uh, turn on your microphone and check that it's working for us and that we can hear you. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah. Thank you very much. Lovely. Again, just remind you, you've got the three Great. minutes and we'll let you know when there's one minute of that time left to go. So please start when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. The applicant has asked me to speak on their behalf regarding the plan application before you today. The applicant requires a new vehicular access as currently the property only has one parking space situated to the rear. This therefore requires the applicant's cars and anyone visiting to park in Old Burnham Road to the rear of the property, which often causes congestion issues. Therefore, the existing pedestrian access is proposed to be removed in order to widen the access so ve vehicles are able to access the proposed driveway and offer parking for two or three vehicles at the front of the property. As can be demonstrated on the plan submitted, there is sufficient visibility display of 43 metres in either direction when pulling out from the property and a car is always able to leave the property in forward gear to prevent reversing directly onto the main road. As can be seen on the enclosed site plans, a driveway will provide a turning circle for vehicles. Furthermore, there is sufficient visibility display for pedestrians walking along the pavement with cars emerging from the property. Therefore, the proposal meets with standing advice as set out by the Highways Agency. Works did commence on site, which is why part of the application is retrospective, as a former red brick wall which was adjacent to Burnham Road was dangerous and was going to collapse and either cause damage to the adjacent pedestrian footway or potentially cause an accident with passing vehicles on Burnham Road. Therefore, it was required that this wall was urgently replaced in order to secure the boundary of the property and prevent any accidents occurring. We note the Town Council have objected to the planning application in view of the visibility display, and we can confirm that there is in fact 3.2 metres from the edge of the highway back to the proposed driveway, which provides sufficient vehicular and footway visibility, which is demonstrated on the plans which form part of the application before you today. 
Additionally, you will note that the visibility display avoids the bus stop, which is situated approximately 12 metres distance from the access. One minute, one minute. Furthermore, one there are residential properties on the opposite side of the road, which all have vehicle access leading directly onto Burnham Road. And there have been no issues with access onto the road nor accidents occurring along this stretch. I would trust you are able to approve the application before you today. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions? I've got Councillor Hendry and then Councillor Facey. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I drive past this all the time. I know exactly where it is, the, the whole layout and everything about it. And to be perfectly honest with you, it's dreadful, absolutely awful. If, if they're saying they could park two or three vehicles in there, which I think is, is correct what they said, there's no way in this world somebody could do a three-point turn to make their car go out in a forward gear. It couldn't happen, just not possible. If this had come before us before they had started, I would doubt very, very much if this would have got put through as actually granted permission. It's on a very, very dangerous, it's just come straight out. I'm sure they have a drop curb, et cetera. That's, that's part of parcel. But it's on a very, very difficult, awkward place on the road to come out on. And I just do not like this one bit. If it had come before us before they started, I doubt if this would ever have got passed. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs DeVries, do you want to comment on retrospective applications and the way we have to deal with them yeah. in respect of retrospective applications it can't hold any weight in the determination so whether they've started or not shouldn't make any difference to the recommendation that members would have as to whether the development is suitable or not in terms of the layout um, in respect to the comment about the three-point turn obviously there's the arched tarmac area and then a proposed gravel area so I think as members can see probably from this slide that if you entered the site and parked in the gravel area there's enough um, space to the front to, be, to enable vehicles to do a three-point turn um, and county highways have raised an objection on it thank you chairman uh, this old apple again um, standing advice Bit bizarre. I was at a meeting last night, Chairman, at Birmingham Highways Town Council, along with Councillor Murphy, and we were shown figures last night of traffic tra travelling on the Highways Road, Burnham Road, uh, Burnham Road High Bridge, on going on an easterly direction, way above the average speed limits. I'm pretty sure that Councillor Murphy will back me on this. So that's a matter of interest regarding to standing advice. Uh, regarding um, the bus stop, which is shown on the drawing there, which is very nice, there is a small uh, projection out for weatherproofing. People stood there, but it does not stop people with prams, pushchairs, young families actually standing right out on the footpath. So, to my mind, that's blocking your view from the right uh, coming, uh, traveling traffic, traveling eastwards, Chairman. Uh, I'm not happy about this one at all, um, purely on the fact that it just doesn't stack to me, the fact of why do they need to come out onto the main road. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Um, a little bit concerned about the height of the wall itself. Uh, 1.6 metres seems fairly, well, quite high for uh, an, an access route, especially onto a road like that. Um, is that standard height on that section? Uh, yeah, Ms. Arby. Hi, sorry, I couldn't hear. Um, so this brick wall here, that is to remain because that belongs to the neighbour. Um, and that is a similar height to this block work wall, which is um, subject to this application. So on this section, I would say that it is um, similar to the other heights. Um, in terms of the visibility display, as well as the drawing that shows the pedestrian visibility, I have also received um, a, a drawing to show that it can achieve the 43 metres visibility in each direction. Um, and I can put that on the screen in a moment. Um, in respect, you know, that is based on the speed limit being 30 miles an hour. And I appreciate that 
there may be other data. I mean, I haven't seen this. Sorry, there's an echo. Um, about cars exceeding that, but there is a roundabout there, so I would think that that would at least slow cars down. Sorry, I keep hearing. Um, there is a mini roundabout there, so I would think that even if a car was um, speeding, um, that the roundabout potentially would slow it down. Remember, just to confirm that you've got your microphones and your speakers turned to off, because we're obviously getting some feedback from somewhere. Okay. okay. Yeah, do you want to try that again, Millie, because we, we, we lost you in a bit of an echo. Sure. So um, I was just saying that I've had drawings saying about the visibility displays. So um, this one, I know it wasn't on the presentation because I was trying to keep it um, condensed, but demonstration there that there is um, 43 metres in each direction. And that 43 metres comes from standing advice because it's a 30 mile an hour road. Um, I appreciate the comments raised that there's perhaps some evidence that cars don't stick to the speed limit in that on that road. I haven't seen that. We can only go by what the posted speed limit is um, but there is a junction there is a mini roundabout there so I would think any cars coming from that direction would at least if they are speeding up slow down because there is that mini roundabout in terms of the other wall on that side of the road the brick wall um, which can be see seen in the photos that belongs to the neighbour so visually it's the same or very similar height to the wall that is being or has been built I think that's everything but um, remind me if I've missed anything. I've got Councillor Murphy and then Councillor Revens, so Councillor Murphy. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I have to say I'm slightly puzzled that Emma... Is it Millie? I'm sorry. Um, is it um, May I call you Millie? Um, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm slightly puzzled at Millie's statement and about the the displays. <clears throat> I mean, clearly, when you look at the map, the main map, you see that uh, you see that the cars are coming have to come out of this gate before they actually encounter a display. If you look at the main map, you'll see that the cars are coming out. Uh, no, that, I think not that map. There's a there's a map actually. Show, there's a there's a showing the the road um, from the opposite side. I think it shows you a drawing of the area. Have you got a map of that drawing, Millie? Can I see that drawing? Well, even looking at it now, you're looking at it, and it's it, this idea that the car has that this actually provides a display, a visual display. Or what do you call it? A, a bell mouth entrance, for example. It does doesn't do that. I mean, what you're doing is talking about a car coming out onto the verge and then it will have some form of bell mouth entrance after it comes out of the gate. There is no bell mouth entrance built into this. And I can understand why the town council would be scared stiff about this because it's very close to a, a bus shelter. As Councillor Facey has already said, this is an extremely busy walking area for mums, it's also a route to the school. It is a, and very busy in the mornings and the afternoons. Um, and I would hasten to add that very, if you look on the opposite side and they're talking about lots of entrances, where are they? They're not shown. And there's no other entrance coming from a house or a dwelling on that side of the road. Um, I'd also like to, to, to pick up the point raised by the previous speaker who was talking about the size of the wall. First of all, to put a breeze block wall alongside a very old brick wall, I think is a travesty. That's number one. Number two, if you look at the picture of the wall, the wall as it stands without the coving stones that are going on the top of it. According to the statement that was made, you said 1.6 meters high with coving stones on the top. Well, there's no coving stones on that, so one assumes that they're going to render it. I saw the word render somewhere in the in the dissertation, so one assumes they're going to render the wall or plaster it and render it or make it into something that looks a bit bit nice. Um, it still won't match the ancient walls on either side, which I think is what, what we're trying to do here. We're trying to turn this this residential area into an industrial area. This is a very very busy area. 
um, and that wall with carvings on top, it's already bigger than the other walls, taller than the other walls. I mean, Millie said, well, it looks almost the same. It's virtually the same. Virtually the same is not the same as the same. So if you add coving stones on top, it's going to look horrible. I would say this is not acceptable. And um, also, I would say that um, with the traffic, uh, I don't know if any of you have been along that road. That is becoming a very, very busy area, especially up to the roundabout and especially with a bus stop there. And the bus stop will completely obscure any so-called Bellmouth entrance that's not there even. So I would have to say that I would I could not support this on the grounds of safety, safety, um, accessibility, and in other words, turning that area into an area, setting the precedent for other buildings to create exits onto that extremely busy road. I'm sorry, I can't say any more than that. I'll mean, and, and be getting too passionate about it. Thank you very much. Ms. Elvey, do you want to comment on any of the, the issues that have been raised? Um, sure, yeah, it's just a couple of things really. So um, in terms of the render on the wall, whilst I appreciate there are red brick walls immediately adjacent, as you can see from this photo, um, the use of render is in the vicinity. Um, and the drawing there shows that it will be 1.65 metres with the coping stones. Um, and in terms of the highway safety element, highways have said standing advice and the information before us shows that it complies with that and unfortunately that's all we can well i can work with you know so i don't really have much more to say on that i don't know if dawn's got anything to add thank you um millie can you just get up the pedestrian visibility display please OK, so from these images, the one thing I want to make clear to members is obviously the grass verge between the pavement and the wall. So the wall isn't immediately fronting the pavement. You've got a setback of the wall with the grass verge and then the pavement. So this display shows what pedestrian visibility display you should have when you're pulling out of a vehicle access to avoid um, pedestrians, people with pushchairs, etc. So in terms of standards, because of the setback, because of the grass verge, this plan shows that there's sufficient pedestrian visibility display as you pull out over the grass verge and over the pavement. Um, Millie, if you can show the pedestrian, um, sorry, the vehicle, that's it. So from this image, what you can see is obviously the grass verge as you're coming out. And then the orange line is the visibility display. As you can see from this plan, the visibility display goes to the front of the bus shelter. The bus shelter doesn't impede on the display. And there is some space to the front of the bus shelter in the, in, in the instance that someone's sort of stood waiting for a bus. On the occasion that there's anyone waiting for a bus, it will be only as and when there are buses that turn up. So in terms of technical highway safety objections, I would raise a bit of a red flag for members because it complies with standing advice. So we would need some technical highway objection if we were refusing it on highway safety grounds. In terms of visual impact, that's down to members in terms of whether the visual impact is so harmful to the character of the area that you'd, you'd refuse it on that basis. If there was concern about the height, because it's retrospective, doesn't carry any weight on how you consider it. If it needed to be marginally lower to accommodate for members' concerns, given its minor elevated height relative to the brick walls, we could cover that through condition. But I just wanted to raise that so that members are fully aware of what they're considering as the debate goes forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got Councillor Revens, then Councillor Bolt and Councillor Hendry. So Councillor Revens. Hello. Yes, I'm on. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if um, Miss Elvia, we might have the visibility display diagram back up, please. Sure, the vehicular one or the Thank pedestrian. Thank you very much. You members will notice that the diagram is drawn here with the edge of the bus shelter being alongside the edge of the grass and the pavements. 
could, and is on the other diagram there. So you can see that there is a straight line going from uh, all, all the way across. Could we could we now go to the, the you have a slide with three pictures on that one no back one thing thank you very much if you look at image five and you look at the bus shelter to me that looks like it's coming out in front of the pavement line apart in front of the grass line so the diagram that we've been shown with the visibility display to me does not look accurate am i mistaken what am i missing miss elving yeah, sorry. I'm just going to measure, measure the gap. gap. Sorry. Oh, don't know if I can. You can hear me. Yeah, I'm just going to measure that gap. Sorry. Carry on. Teams. There we go. So I think based on the plan and the photos, there is a minor encroachment of the advert area on the bus stop that comes out slightly further than the edge. But that's 40 centimetres. From the photo, it doesn't look like a 40 centimetre encroachment, so it's still full behind the visibility display. But Millie, if you want to confirm. Yeah, I agree, Dawn. Of course, at a distance, that visibility display is considerably reduced just by that 40 centimetres. So I would, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little bit cautious about how that diagram is drawn and how it looks different on that photograph. Um, can I also just, just go to the highways advice that's there? And I'm particularly curious about the last sentence that they raise. The property appears to have off-road parking at the rear, so it is not clear why another is necessary and could set a precedent for further accesses onto from the B3139. I, I appreciate the syntax isn't all that it could be in that sentence. But to me, that is highways expressing a concern about that rather than a unadulterated uh, three cheers for this application. I, am I in, interpreting this differently? Agree. I think based on the comment that's been submitted, they haven't raised any highway safety objections to the access. They just raised a question as to why you need two. In terms of the information provided as part of the presentation, they've got access to the back with a single parking space. So any other additional vehicles will be taken up um, on street parking in the surrounding area. So the um, will for another access to the front was to take existing um, cars off the highway and if the access is safe, then there's no reason to object to two accesses to a property. Go to the blue line application um, um, diagram that there was, please. Sorry, do you mean that there slide? as well so there's a building to the rear which has got a gray roof and a building to the side with a brown roof can we just clarify what those two buildings are please that sure um i know the gray roof one is a garage um i must admit i'm not entirely sure about the one with the brown roof to me there would be the possibility of reorganizing what they have at the back in order to accommodate the extra parking spaces as an alternative, um, the highways have expressed concern about a second uh, uh, access, and I think there is an alternative that the applicants could explore. Thank you. We, we can't necessarily, we, we can't turn something down because there might be a better alternative. We have to decide whether what's in front of us is acceptable. Uh, yeah. There is very clearly stated in the highways application that they have concern that this would set a precedent um, and that we have to abide by the highways concern. You know, for, for unusually, there is a highways concern, and I don't want us to ignore it. Thank you, Ms. Elve or, or Ms. Debris. Do you want to make any further comments at that point before I come to other councillors? No. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so we've got councillors Bolt, Hendry, and then Facey. So councillor Bolt.
you hear me? <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I think I'm in this time. If, could we go back to um, slide six, please? I'm not sure if it's five or six, but I think it's six. Right, thank you. That's the first instance. The next one will be five. The vehicle there is more or less in the position where you're going to end up with a bus stopped. I don't know how long they stop for. I don't know how often they run. But if you've got people getting on or off, your visibility display is exactly this, this side of that um, bus shelter. Vehicles coming out onto that roundabout, joining the roundabout, will be looking to the right to make sure it's clear and to go around a bus. I'm sorry, but I don't think it's safe um, to say that the visibility display is correct. It doesn't take into account that you will have a, a mobile obstruction there, hopefully numerous times a day. Uh, I, I just can't agree with the safety side of it. If we go to um, slide five, I think it shows it better. No, slide five. Yeah, I've got it now. Yeah, if you look there, your visibility is going to be the edge of the double yellow lines. Um, anything turning right there is turning blind into opposing traffic potentially. Uh, standing advice, you know, it's all very well, but it stood at an inquest and saying standing advice isn't very healthy. All I would say to members is if 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 members are heading towards a recommendation of refusal, then obviously you need to have the valid planning grounds to to back that up. So just bear in mind that's where you need to be. Mr. Debris. Thank you. I just wanted to say in terms of the um, concerns that are being expressed by members, some of it's about whether the visibility space is accurate, where the location of the bus stop is, how frequent the bus goes. Um, that type of thing, and also the use of the rear of the site. I would suggest that if members had concerns about those aspects, the best route forward in that respect might be a deferral to allow officers to gather that information to come back to you with that additional detail to allow you then to make a proper assessment based on the information available for that site. Um, beyond that obviously there were concerns about the visual impact of the wall obviously that remains static so you know however members want to consider that but in terms of the highway concerns that are being expressed i think probably what you need is, is a deferral for gathering more information to be able to settle your minds in terms of what the potential impact could be Okay, can you hear me? Of all the comments here today about this, there's not one positive comment, nothing, nothing at all. And Councillor Brian Bull brought up a very good point there about if there's a bus park there too. I use this road all the time, every day. And if you come from Burnham to what's called a Highbridge roundabout, uh, sorry, the Asda roundabout, everybody knows there, on busy times, uh, morning, lunchtime, late afternoon, the traffic coming up through there is nose to tail, it's horrendous. But don't forget, you've got the traffic coming into Burnham as well. And if you pulled out, out of that driveway wanting to turn right when the busy traffic's there, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely impossible. It's ridiculous. It's, anybody from Burnham would tell you that is backed up there. There is nothing positive I could say about that there. Nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor. We'll need some new wipes in a moment, Chairman. Yes, Chairman. Um, not concerned about the wall at all, Chairman. It's a purely safe aspect. And I would like to take up Mr. Devere's offer um, for its expertise and hoping I can get support to have this deferred. Because some of those measurements, as Councillor Revin's come up with, they don't actually stand. I went past there this morning twice to have a look at that. Um, there are mentions about houses opposite. Houses of it have a drive, but they've also got three, probably four metres of lawn 
and superb view. That is a very dangle, uh, tight angle there uh, relating to the technicalities of display, Chairman. So I'm quite, I'm not quite pleased. I'm really asking for a deferral, Chairman. I propose that. Thank you. And that's that's a deferral to get further technical information on the the, the act. Technicalities of the spray, Chairman. Potentially that whether whether things like the bus being in in its position have been taken into account in terms of safety aspects. Okay. Are you happy with that, Mr. De You understand what's being re requested. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lehman, is there? Are you happy that you are happy that that's? Uh, a reasonable comment that we can go for with a deferral. I agree, Chairman. It's a it's a reasonable comment. And then Councillor Evans. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, the one concern I've got is um, looking at the site plan. It shows a very a relatively small garden with a gravelled area for a, a turning circle, so that it can. You can drive in and turn and exit at a forward gear. We all know that you should always re leave a property in forward gear, but people do reverse out of these properties. And I'm concerned if you've got another car in there, how are they going to be able to turn around? Because it is rather a very restricted area. It looks big on the plan, but when you've got to turn a vehicle with maybe another vehicle in there, it, it doesn't happen. So it's one area that I'm a little bit concerned with. See, would you be happy for that to be something again that's taken into account the adequacy of the, the turning area of the site? Yes. Councillor Evans. Um, hello. Happy to say hello. Yeah. Happy to second uh, Councillor Facey's request for a deferral. I wonder whether he'd also accept um, a possible exploration of another another way forward, which is to look at relocating the bus stop at the expense of the applicants, which may also um, assist. Facey's proposal. OK, Councillor Murphy. Thank, thank you. Um, just one final point. Um, I would like you to know after 40 years living in Burnham on sea and living and working in Highbridge every day, I am someone who's traveled this road every single day in life, apart from when I've been going up all over the country. And one of the areas that we you have to take, you, I would actually ask you to, to consider with the highways is just a few yards beyond the um, beyond the, the bus stop is Pepperell Road. And that roundabout is a giveaway roundabout. It's just a small roundabout in the middle of the road, which is a giveaway. And, and the people in Pepperell Road can sometimes have to wait for a very long time to get out because the traffic keeps coming and it is full on that road. At many times, I'm sure my colleagues will agree with me, you have, it's absolutely jam packed all the way up past the school to the Asda roundabout. You are not talking about uh, a road that's, you know, easy to deal with. It's not easy. You've got to be very vigilant, especially at that roundabout. And that's just before you come onto the bus stop and just before you come onto this proposed exit. So I can fully understand the concern of the town council about this. It's not about trying to thwart the people who need the access or want the access. It's a purely about safety. That's all I can see. Much. I'm not seeing anyone else indicating at this point. So we have a recommendation that's been moved and seconded, which is a deferral to liaise in terms of the, the detail of the, the highway safety, the visibility displays and uh, turning areas. So those in favour of that recommendation for deferral, please show. That looks to be unanimous. That's unanimous, Chairman. Yep, clearly carried. So that is deferred. Uh, do we need to put any sort of time scale on, or just literally for it to come back once we've got the information? But but we up to two committees. Yeah. Well, well, we'll again. Two committees, but obviously we need to make sure that we've got the information sorted. Okay. Members, if we move to the next application, we have a speaker, and then I'm going to suggest after that when we take a, a short comfort break. Um, so that's page 
132. And we move to East Huntsville and Ms Parsons, I think you're presenting this one for us. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is an application for the erection of a detached dwelling. Um, this is on the land to the south of Swallows Watch Farm, which is um, a holiday accommodation. Um, the site is uh, located outside of any settlement boundary and within flood zone three. You can see that it's located to, to the east of the M5 motorway and it's almost a mile to the west of East Huntsville. The, the land, the site forms part of a larger area of land that was formerly attached to Long East Farm, which is a dwelling here. Uh, that's subsequently been uh, sold. The, within the land also, there is a holiday unit that was approved and has been um, in use for holiday let for some time. Also, consent was granted for in 2019 for the erection of two further holiday units within this area, and that's currently under construction. Um, as you can see, it's in a rural area with fields to the south and the east. To the west is the Secret World um, Wildlife Sanctuary and some of the barns here that were attached to the listed building are currently being converted to residential use. So this is an aerial really showing clearly the same, the site shown um, outlined in red and the context of the site within its surrounding area. And again, this really is showing the same. Um, in terms of, I'll just run through some photographs before I show you the actual proposal. This is the existing vehicular access into the site. This would be utilised to gain access to the site for the proposed dwelling. To, this is the end elevation of Long East Farm, which used to be in the applicant's control. Uh, this is, you can just about see the gable here of the one of the um, tourism units. Going into the site, that is that tourism unit I was outlining earlier. And that's fully functioning, I understand. Now, this is looking across to where currently under construction are two other tourist, tourist units. And this is the area um, upon which the proposal relates. There is a public footpath that runs alongside this land further on towards Secret World, as well as running further south um, alongside the site. Another view um, looking further westwards of the land and then looking from the corner right into the site. Um, and there is a public footpath that runs to the south here. And that is the side of the existing holiday unit you can see behind the, the stacks. Now, just to run through a few more photographs, these were they submitted with part of the, with, as part of the application by the applicant's agent. Uh, this is the views of the woodland planting to the south of the site. The top photograph shows views from within the site to the west and the listed building. And then the bottom photograph shows the view within the site looking towards one of the holiday units being constructed. Further views from um, the top one is looking south. I'm sorry, these are not very clear. View within the site looking southwest again towards the existing holiday unit. This is, this is the layout. So it is proposed to construct um, a dwelling located here within the fields. This area here, which you won't be able to see very clearly on the slide, but this area here is landscaping. And so the existing vehicular access that you could see as a gravel track runs and joins New Road up here. Uh, this is the existing holiday unit functioning. And th these two areas are the location of the uh, two approved holiday units. The proposal seeks to provide um, a three bed, sink, two storey property in the form of a bungalow. Two bedrooms would be downstairs with one bedroom with an ensuite upstairs. I'm just going to go back to the site plan. Now, in terms of the principle of residential development in this location, there are policies within the local plan that's, that support exceptional development within the countryside for dwellings. 
Um, those include, the policies include D10, which relates to rural workers' dwellings, D9, self-build and custom-build dwellings, and D10, sorry, and CO2 infill housing in the countryside. Now, within the um, agenda on page 135, the policy points or the criteria of the policy for D10 has been um, copied and posted there for your information. This relates to rural workers' dwellings. Now, policy D10 supports the erection of dwellings to meet the accommodation needs of permanent workers in agriculture or other rural businesses outside of the identified settlement boundaries, provided certain criteria are met and those the set of criteria is listed. Now, the applicant stated that this proposal would allow them to downsize their living accommodation to the north of the site whilst remaining in close proximity to the tourism site to manage and service it as necessary. However, it is understood that the applicant's dwelling has subsequently been sold and they no longer reside at Long East Farm, which was here, which is here. Notwithstanding this, the provision of three lodges in isolation would not normally be sufficient to support a full residential dwelling. It is not considered that it has been adequately demonstrated why a dwelling is required to satisfy a functional need to live at the site that cannot be met within a defined settlement boundary, the nearest being approximately a mile away, or that the other criteria within policy 10 has been met. In terms of policy CO2, which relates to infill housing on in the countryside, the uh, policy criteria is listed on page 136 of the agenda. In respect of the site relative to this policy, it's considered that the proposed dwelling would be sited within a paddock to the south of the relatively recently approved holiday cottages. The built development comprising of these holiday units, the main dwelling and secret world to the west does not constitute a small village, a hamlet or a clearly defined nucleus of existing dwellings. While the proposal is to be a self-build or a custom-build project, it fails to meet policy D9. It does not amount to infilling of the main built-up area of the settlement as the site is to the south of the existing holiday units and would project out into the open countryside and as such would not maintain or enhance the sustainable patterns of development. It would physically extend the built form into the open countryside. The development is not in accordance with policy D19, the landscape policy, due to its extension of the built environment into the countryside without any exceptional need for such development. It's considered therefore that the principle of a dwelling on this site fails to meet policy CO2. In respect of policy D9, this relates to self-build and custom-build homes. Again, the, the policy criteria is listed on page 137 of the agenda. In respect of the site relative to policy D9, it is considered that it fails to meet the infill policy, CO2. No evidence has been provided to demonstrate that the future occupants are identified on the register. No evidence has been provided of the future occupiers being fully involved in the planning and design process from an early stage. And the development of a dwelling to the south of the holiday units within the open paddock would not complement the existing built form. And due to its distance from settlements, it does not provide opportunities for walking and cycling to local services and facilities. It's considered in terms of the principle of the development, therefore, the proposal fails to meet the criteria of the policies CO2, D9 and D10. In terms of impact on highway safety, the access would be via the existing access that serves the existing approved holiday units. The Highway Authority referred to their standing advice and it's considered that there is adequate access, the parking um, is sufficient and therefore there is no objection in terms of highway safety. In terms of flood risk, the site is within flood zone 3, which is an area with a high probability of flooding. A flood risk assessment, a sequential test and exceptions test have been submitted with the application. Now, the proposal seeks to create a new dwelling which would be a more vulnerable use within Flood Zone 3. While this is for a self-built scheme and the applicant states that they wish to downsize their property but wish to remain in close proximity to and to service the three units, the proposal does not meet, meet the self-built policy criteria 
an insufficient justification has been provided for a new dwelling in the countryside um, based on the other exception policy criteria. It's not therefore considered that there is an operational or a locational need for the requirement for a dwelling to be in this location. The search area for the purposes of such a sequential test is the whole of the district. And as there are other sites more appropriate for the erection of a dwelling, the se sequential test fails. Therefore, the development fails to comply with the flood policy D1. To conclude, the proposal fails to comply with the self-build, the infill and rural workers policies, which seeks to establish the principle of development in a countryside location. As there is no operational requirement demonstrated for a dwelling in this location, the proposal also fails to meet policy D10 in terms of flood risk, and therefore the recommendation is to refuse permission for the two reasons stated in the report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr Caldwell, would you like to come forward? Well, good morning. Uh, my name's Graham Caldwell and I'm the applicant of this self-build proposal. In March of this year, my wife and I had to make a decision to sell off part of our title. We sold the barn, which I converted for a family of four, and we lived in for over 16 years. Our children are now at the age where they've left home and the property was too big for the two of us. Due to the long and very narrow shape of the barn, it was problematic to subdivide and adjust the accommodation. We've kept our new build holiday let, which is run by my wife and myself, and has been successful in the three years it has been running. We also have a recently approved planning application for additional holiday let accommodation, which is all set in an area of approximately two acres. We are currently renting a static caravan on a park which is situated nearby to our business. It is essential to be close as we need to be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our self-build proposal is to downsize and is situated within 50 metres of the holiday nets and approximately 150 metres of a residential uh, development currently taking place near Secret World Wildlife Rescue Centre. All materials would be to match existing properties nearby and any issues of flood would be overcome by replicating the new holiday lets. This was achieved by raising the floor levels and landscaping accordingly, and also the provision of an area of refuge on the first floor. In the winter of 2020, National Grid completed a tree planting scheme, and we now have approximately 1,000 tree and hedgerow saplings planted. In addition, we now have beehives, and we're trying to create a natural habitat for wildlife. To finish, I would like to add that I would accept a conditional tie to our self-build and the holiday let business if this was a deciding factor for a positive outcome. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Members, any comments or questions, please? I'm not seeing any. Councillor Kingham. OK, then, Chairman, thank you. Um, now, we've, this application is in flood zone three. Now, normally this is a, a no-go. I know as this is a two-storey house, this is something that uh, would allow this building to be erected. Start or Miss Parsons. Thank you. Um, just in terms of flood zone, part of the test is to demonstrate that it's being located in the lowest possible flood risk area. Um, in terms of locating it in flood zone three, there would need to be other policies that support its location in flood zone three first for us to then limit the search area to that um, location. Um, this site 
is up and operational as a, as a tourist site. There's an existing unit currently um, occupied and two under construction, but a scale of tourist site for three units um, historically would not normally be considered sufficient to justify a, a rural workers dwelling on site to manage and maintain those units. The, the, the difficulty the applicant has in this situation is that, that there aren't the mitigating factors that allow you to go beyond the, what would be the normal development boundary. So the, the rural workers or, or even the, uh, the self-build would be looking for a, a, a nucleus of development, which this site doesn't currently have. So that's, that's the difficulty the applicant has got in trying to, uh, to get over that hurdle. Any other questions or comments from members? The bungalow, then obviously it would, you would just say no, no way. But as this is a two story, it does have that safety aspect in. Yeah, the fact that it's got an upstairs gives you the refuge, but it's again getting over the principle of the policy is the, is the difficulty this one's struggling with. Council, Councillor Evans. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just down the loop. I'm just trying to understand the wider uh, context of the settlement around this. I'm aware that we've had planning permissions for barn conversions and the area around it. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to work out how many dwellings we have in the settlement and how close the dwellings in Catherine Street across the road are, as well as whether the, we consider those to be part of the same settlement or not. Do you want to take that? <laughs> Guessing that's a no. So, Miss Mr. Mr. Devries, I think Shanta might be frozen. I'm just seeing if I can get Google Maps so I can get a slightly zoomed out version of this. Um, in terms of principle, barn conversions have a separate policy that they can be supported under. Um, they're slightly more relaxed in terms of introducing residential use than new build. Um, and in terms of residential development, you'd be looking at a cluster or a hamlet, and most of them have been converted for holiday lets. So it's not out and out residential within the locality. Um, I'm just seeing if I can get up a site location plan. Shanta, I don't know if you're back. Do you know how many units there are? Yeah. Um, I hadn't gone anywhere. I didn't realise, maybe I didn't see a signal that I was asked to comment. Um, so basically, um, we've got um, a barn that was converted here many years ago. And we've got the main listed building here. And a barn that's being converted here and here. I'm not sure if there are any more converted dwellings. This area of land here is a Secret World uh, Wildlife Rescue Centre. Uh, there is under the applicant's control the holiday unit that's been approved and been functioning in this location and then two holiday units in this location that have been approved not yet completed. Um, in terms of development in Pear Tree Farm or Mullins Farm I'm not aware that there is residential there or not other than the farmhouse and Catherine Street is here. Um, I mean clearly the site is not within a settlement and it's not classed as a hamlet. It's it's really a countryside location. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bolton, then Councillor Grimes. Just kind of clarification of something you said, uh, Chairman. For CD10, for it to be a a, a building which is required for a, a business in, in the countryside. How many um, units would have to be there for it to be required? Um, we've got it for a settlement, but I don't see anything in policy that says you've got to have X amount. And it would appear that this person is actually developing that site, i.e. they've just put another unit in. So this is a slightly zoomed out version. 
of um, Google Maps. So we've got a secret world rescue centre here. Screen for the moment. I don't know whether it's. Oh, it's because I'm not sharing. Yeah, just bear with a moment. Trying to get the. Taken over Shanta's sharing, so she's going to have to share back at a later point. That's not working. That's not going to share outside the room. Um, in terms of location, this will only show four members in the committee room, but it's a zoomed out version of Google Street Maps. So Secret World Wildlife Centres down here, the site being applied for is in this location down here, and Catherine Street, as referenced, is slightly up here. Sandra, I'm happy if you want to share back. Normally see as warranting in terms of a commercial venture to warrant having the residential on site. Yeah. The policy in terms of policy D10, um, obviously Shant has listed it out in the report. But in terms of the bullet points, it says that the applicant needs to demonstrate that the dwelling is required to satisfy a clearly established functional need to live at or near the place of work that cannot be met within the defined settlement boundaries. That's the first point. Um, in response to that first point, they did previously own one of the buildings within the site and the settlement boundary is a mile away. They're not currently living on site. Um, and they're travelling to and fro back from the site and there's only one current building up and operational. The other two are still under construction. So based on the information we've got, officers are not happy that there's enough justification for a new building in the countryside um, that couldn't be met um, elsewhere. Um, the second point is the rural business should have been established for at least three years. So the first unit has been up and operational, the other two are still under construction. Um, the functional need cannot be, be fulfilled by an existing suitable and available dwelling, either on the unit or in the area. Again, we're not satisfied that that's been clearly demonstrated as part of the application. And the proposal is well related to the rural business. I think it's probably fair to say this site is well related to the tourism units, but that in itself isn't enough to justify a new building. Um, and the size should be commensurate with the need. I don't think there's any objection in terms of the size that's being proposed, but it's, it's the failure to comply with the first few bullet points, which unfortunately has made the conflict with policy. Grimes and then Councillor Pierce. So Councillor Grimes. Thank you. Yes, unfortunately, I can't support this for the reasons given by the officers. I mean, I reluctantly I will move the recommendation to refuse. Thank you, Chairman. Can you? Yeah, that's OK, isn't it? Um, yeah, I share the concerns about this application uh, for all the reasons within the report. It, it seems to be a business that's been developed on a site where there are um, many constraints for good reasons, um, it's on the flood zone, and it's in uh, it's that the policies are there to protect the rural environment. And to me, this seems to be a step too far. So um, I will second Councillor Grimes recommendation to refuse. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions that members have? I'm not seeing any. So in which case we have a recommendation that has been moved and seconded to refuse permission. Uh, those in favour of that recommendation, please show. Unanimous. That is clearly carried, so permission is, is, is refused. 
members, as I said earlier, we'll take a short comfort break at this point. If we break for 10 minutes and restart at 20 past, when we'll take the application on page 141, where we have a, a speaker present as well. Right, welcome back to uh, to the Development Committee. We'll carry on with our next application where we have a speaker present. If members and uh, members of the public can turn to page 141 on their agendas, and we're in the Nether Stowey, and I think Mr Evans, you're presenting this one. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is uh, a site on the west side of Nether Stowey, um, and it's for the erection of a detached self-built dwelling. Um, I'll take members through the slides now. So, Liam, if you want to uh, start your presentation again, please. OK, yeah, sure. Uh, so this is an application for a self-built dwelling located on the west side of Nether Stowey. Uh, this aerial photograph shows the location uh, highlighting the grey circle there. Um, let Liam know that we can't hear him yet. Try again. OK, Liam, do you want to try again? Just start. Can you hear me now? OK, just all right. Just just bear with us one minute, Liam. We're just uh, sorting out some IT stuff this end. OK. I've got a few, but I'm not sure I'm allowed to use them on the teams, but. Uh... <sighs> OK, we'll try again. Liam, do you want to just start from from the beginning? Uh, can you hear me? Am I coming through? <laughs> Anything? Again, Liam? Can you hear me now? Hello? Um, Liam, do you want to go ahead? Can, can you hear me? Uh, OK. Give, give it a go, Liam, and we'll just check how it goes as you as you make a start. OK, uh, so the application is located on the west side of Nether Stowey. And it is for a south build dwelling. Um, uh, for a current resident of Nether Stowey. The application site is accessed from Jackson's Lane, uh, where there's an existing access that leads to a stable block located to the north of the application site. Is that coming through okay? Yep, okay. Um, so this is the aerial photograph showing where the site is uh, in relation to Nether Stowey. These slides indicate uh, the existing built up form of the village and the surrounding area. Uh, two considerations that have come up during the course of the application are its proximity to the development boundary of Never Stowey. Now, policy D9 supports the erection of self-built dwellings on the edge of settlements, uh, which are tiers one to four, as designated within the local plan. The site itself is located, this is the development boundary indicated by the green line, and the application site is located here. So in principle, it's considered that the site does comply with policy D9 in relation to its proximity to the development boundary. The site is also to the north of the AOMB designation, uh, which is defined uh, along Hack Lane here. The application site is indicated by the red line here uh, with the dwelling proposed coming off the existing access, which serves the stable block here. This will uh, fork to the south and provide access for a turning and parking area for the dwelling. So this is the site plan. The access will, the access will be from Mill Lane, um, where it meets Jackson Lane. And we'll, we'll, Uh, 
I could, I'll continue. Um, so the application site is uh, to utilize the existing access and will be cut into the hillside of the application site, which is on um, steeply sloping ground uh, as it rises to the west and towards the OMB. The application site is currently lined by tree planting along the highway um, with sporadic planting also within the site in the form of an orchard uh, and, and uh, other shrub and tree planting nearby. The application is seeking a permission for a two-storey dwelling. Um, the ground floor plan will include uh, two of the bedrooms of the three bedroom property with the upper floor dedicated to the living areas, um, office and ensuite uh, bathroom. The application was also include a carport uh, below the first floor level. Uh, and as I said, the parking area will be uh, utilized for turning as well. The proposed dwelling uh, will be in the form of a two story structure uh, finished in a combination of timber cladding to the lower part of the building and uh, dark grey stainless, uh, sorry, dark grey steel cladding to the roofs and upper sections of the walls. Uh, the section here, the south elevation here, shows how the dwelling itself will cut into the land and will sit below the, the ground level of the existing field uh, and sloping site to, that rises to the west. This is uh, a clearer section of the building, um, so the existing slope will be cut into with the bedroom accommodation uh, located on the ground floor with the floor, first floor level and the land level slightly raised up to provide access across a, a bridged access to the upper floor section. This indicates where Mill Lane is uh, and the existing tree planting is along the highway, which uh, will also be shown on the photographs. Uh, this is a west elevation view uh, taken from, uh, so just to indicate the change in land levels result in the views from this direction of a single storey building as the ground floor level will be sited below the existing and built up floor level or ground levels of the field in which the building will be situated. Um, during the course of the application, um, we've uh, worked with the applicants on uh, obtaining uh, additional landscape planting uh, to try and um, improve uh, and improve the landscaping along the boundaries of the site, which were proposed at the outset of the planning application. Um, we've also sought to provide landscaping along the boundaries of the south side of the field, uh, which is alongside the public right of way. Um, this is these plans just indicate the locations of the possible planting that would be included with the development. Uh, however, we have included the condition requiring the landscaping scheme to be confirmed uh, post decision should an application be granted. Uh, as I said, the AOMB has been a, a factor within the application. The report sets out the reasons for objections from uh, the AOMB service in regard of the proposal. Um, from an officer's perspective, it's considered that the AOMB itself is located a sufficient distance away from the site not to have a de detrimental impact uh, on, on the setting of the AOMB or views out of. Um, this is a landscape visual impact uh, illustration which demonstrates viewpoints from outside of the OMB, um, which are closer to the site than the actual AOMB designation is. Um, but it just indicates the changing, land, changing topography of the landscape, which enables the de development to be more or less hidden from view from uh, major vantage points within the OMB. Uh, the site itself is on lower ground compared to a lot of the land within the area, uh, significantly so in relation to the OMB. Um, it's not considered that it will be a visual impact uh, on the character or setting of the OMB. These slides just indicate a little bit closer because it was felt there was, there was quite a lot of information to get across on that previous slide. So um, what we have on this slide is a panoramic view taken from the highest point uh, just outside the AOMB. So the AOMB is, is basically bounded by Hack Lane 
uh, along its northern boundary in, in respect of this area of Nether Stowey. And, and viewpoint one, which is located at the bottom of the screen here, indicates how the proposed development will be seen in respect of the context of the surrounding landscape. So the applicant, uh, the applicant's agent has pointed out to various features within the area which uh, indicates the proposed development, which will be in this area here behind these trees. If I take moments through these slides, so few points two and three. So few point two shows the land as it slopes up to the west. Uh, the OMB uh, is behind these hills. So in effect, will be screened from view. And likewise, the development will be screened from view from the OMB. Uh, viewpoint three, which is taken further up the uh, footpath, the public right of way along the hillside, would be uh, viewing down towards the east. Uh, and you can see that the development itself will be seen against the backdrop of the bungalows with normally close and the uh, higher density residential development within the village itself. So in terms of context, it's not considered that the development itself will have a detrimental impact in its own right, given its uh, backdrop of existing residential dwellings in the area, uh, coupled with the proposed landscaping improvements to the surrounding boundaries and within the site, it's considered that this development can be assimilated into the, the wider landscape. Uh, these viewpoints are taken from uh, further back along the public right of way. So as you can see, the further west you go towards the OMB, the greater the distance that is uh, put between the application site and the designated area, you can see that the uh, prox the um, prominence of the development becomes less and less. So it, you can just about make out the ridge line on this photograph here. Beyond that, you are then coming further towards Hack Lane and the prominence of the development becomes almost negligible. View point six, uh, this is taken from further south of the site. Uh, this is from Hack Lane, but again, you can see that it is significantly below the land levels uh, in this area and therefore does not uh, protrude above the, the, the topography of the land within the area. And finally, view point seven, uh, this is from the highway uh, junction of Hack Lane and Jackson's Lane. So further along this highway is where the access would be to the site along here. Uh, you can see the uh, semi-detached, one of the semi-detached dwellings along Hack Lane here, uh, which characterises this this particular part of the highway. And again, the site itself is is invisible from this area here. Uh, these uh, these photographs have been taken by myself uh, in relation to the site. Uh, so this is a viewpoint from the public right away to the south. This is the closest and probably most noticeable. You'll see the development. You can just about make out the stable building, which is on this area here, just above the shrubs there. Uh, the dwelling itself will sit in this area here uh, behind this tree line, uh, will be cut into the land uh, in that area there. This is a viewpoint taken from the public right of way, uh, as indicated on the plan below, uh, which again ind indicates the steepness of the rising land towards the west. Uh, and just emphasising the, the illustrations that were provided by the agent in respect of the change in topography and the uh, disconnect from the AOMB itself, which is apparently, I'm uh, sorry, approximately 240 metres away. This is a viewpoint taken, again, uh, this is probably repeating what's already just been seen on the agent's uh, photographs, but it, it just for clarity, you can see the residential development, uh, including Audley Close in the foreground. Uh, and the residential development beyond. Um, this is where the development will be seen in relation to the public right of way. Uh, but as I said, this is a lower part of the, uh, the, the, the landscape, the, the hillside. Uh, and while it will be noticeable from here, it's considered that including landscaping along the west side of the dwellings and the south, sorry, the dwelling along the west side and the south will, uh, will successfully integrate the building with the surrounding area. This is a viewpoint taken from um, from Mill Lane and the junction of Jackson Lane at, at further up. Uh, this is the site in behind these trees here. So as you can see, the, the, the existing boundaries along the east side of the site are fairly well landscaped at, mo at the present. Um, and this will be 
augmented with further planting beyond these trees to uh, reinforce that boundary and that, and that screening. This is the proposed access uh, into the site. Uh, so this is currently used by the applicant to uh, tend to the stables and the orchard that has been planted recently within the site. Um, this will be utilised and the dwelling will be behind this area here. So the, the access will fork it towards the south um, and the increase in vehicle movements will be negligible given the fact that the applicants uh, frequently travel to the site uh, for their stables. Uh, in fact, it could result in a decrease in vehicle movements uh, given that they will not have to travel uh, from their current address into the site to tend to horses and the orchard. Uh, this is a view taken from the access back towards Stowey Castle, the scheduled monument here, uh, and this is orderly close here, which provides a buffer between the uh, scheduled monument and the application site as well as, as the highway. So again, it, it gives an indication of the current built form of the area. Um, some comments have been received regarding the design of the dwelling and how it is not in keeping with the bungalows within orderly close. However, given uh, the site's location and the proposed design, which is considered to be, uh, seems to be considered to be acceptable uh, as it has attempted to replicate a more traditional barn like conversion design, um, that it would be considered in its own context to be acceptable. Um, and this is a view taken from north of the access towards uh, Nether Stowey uh, into the village here. Um, this is currently a dwelling that's under construction at the junction of uh, Jackson Lane and Mill Lane. And uh, just to give an idea of, again, the context of the built environment that the site is adjacent to. If I go back to the slides um, of the plans. So yes, the, the application has proposed a two-storey dwelling uh, cut into the ground uh, with a, a rural, uh, more modern, contemporary type of rural approach to uh, the outside and the design. Um, it's considered that this approach is acceptable. Uh, the dark materials to the roof and upper walls will blend with the uh, dark landscaping uh, and the, the species of trees that are around the, the immediate area. Um, and will successfully integrate itself with the uh, natural environment that the building will sit within. Um, it is considered, therefore, the application is acceptable and uh, the recommendation is to grant consent. Thank you. Jason Keswick, would you like to come forward, please? Yeah, thank you. This application is being made by a young member of the Nether Stowey community. She has owned the land on which this modest self-built home is being proposed since 2006, which extends to 10.5 acres. She currently res resides on the other side of the village, traveling to and from this site daily, along with her parents who live in Cannington. 15 years, the applicant has been breeding pedigree rare breed sheep, developing the site's biodiversity, planted in excess of 500 trees, an orchard and improved native hedgerows. The proposal submitted are to create a modest three bedroom home as a self build project located on the applicant site, to have a close relationship with the existing settlement and community, whilst also reducing its impact on the surrounding countryside. The design has been carefully considered to be of high quality, appropriately detailed to fit into its context and minimise any impact. This has been achieved by setting the property into the hillside such that it appears as a single storey structure from the west. It is also closely related to the existing entrance to utilise this access without any need to create additional breaks in the existing planting to Jackson's Lane. Domestic curtilage has also been kept to a minimum and with no formal garden proposals, the building will sit in the site with an agricultural aesthetic. It's disappointing that the parish council objected so strongly um, as this self built development is from an established young member of the community. This is compounded by the fact that the Nellistowy neighbourhood plan makes it clear that its objectives are to meet the needs of local families, specifically those young families that are driven out by increased housing costs and those unable to remain in or return to settle in the village. In this case, the applicant is a member of the community and will remain so and continue to utilise her land, opening up her current property to a new member. 
In regards to the objections from local residents, mostly within the adjoining Audley Close, the proposals in this application will not result in any flooding, cause over dominance, overshadowing or, or overlooking of these properties. The access won't be dangerous and the proposals will not destroy the view from Sturry Castle. The design drawings, visual impact assessments and planning officers report all assist in showing why the proposals do not cause any of the impacts raised. This is also the case for the OMB officers comments following an extensive on site appraisal and the production of visual impact assessment. It was deemed that the proposals cannot be seen from any vantage point within the area of outstanding natural beauty and has just as little impact within the open countryside outside of the OMB, most of which is owned by the applicant. It is our belief that the proposed modest agricultural style self built dwelling is of high quality, meets a required and recognised need, meets all planning policies and should be granted consent. We have worked proactively with Central District Council's Council through pre-application advice service planning process to present a thorough and quality proposal. Thank you. Members, any comments or questions, please? Councillor Kingham. I don't need to turn it off now. Is it on, is it? Is it really? Oh. Right. I don't think we've got a, a flood problem with this one. <laughs> I think the, uh, the uplink has gone a long way to creating a, a very nice modern style building within an area of outstanding natural beauty. And the way that they've uh, constructed that thing, built it into the ground, I think it uh, goes a long way to feeling that they want to sort of maintain a, a building which is unobtrusive. At the moment, I have no problem with this application. I think it's, they've got a small chimney, but a chimney. Questions that members have? Yeah, Councillor Evans. Hello. Yes, I'm on. Um, yeah, just just to confirm with the, you know, I've read the AONB comments with interest, just to confirm that an LVIA was submitted with the application, and that's the, to the satisfaction of officers. Thank you. Um, I noticed that there are a number of um, queries about the impact on the heritage assets of uh, Stowe Castle, and uh, I didn't see much discussion in the report of policy D26. Are we happy that we're compliant? With that, please. Mr. Evans. Uh, yes, so the, the application yeah, site yeah, is yeah, uh, yeah. within um, on the west side of, of, of the village where the Stowe Castle scheduled monument is. Um, we have had comments back from the uh, Southwest Heritage Trust who recommended a, a condition requiring on site monitoring during the excavation of the site in case of any remains. Um, we feel that the based on the location of the site, uh, which is here in relation to Stowe Castle, which is here between the two, we have Audley Close, which is a fairly domestic uh, bungalow cul-de-sac, uh, which in itself um, provides a buffer between the two. And we feel that with the landscaping that's already in place and that which would be uh, provided and, and the cutting in of the development into the hillside that the ridge line and the massing of the building will not have a negative impact on the uh, setting of Stowe Castle. Uh, the major vantage points uh, from which it can be seen within the village uh, will not be affected or dominated by this development. Um, so we feel comfortable that the development itself has taken into account the, the setting of the castle and that there will be no negative impact upon it. Thank you. Of the house, please. Back to the uh, the, the the design. Uh, was it the elevations, Councillor Revens? Yes, or please, the, yeah. If you could do the elevations, please. Or 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 or. Sorry for sorry for myself. Um, I'm very mindful of policy D24. Uh, 
Okay, um, my apologies. I'll try again. Um, I'm seeing quite a lot of, um, of uh, large window space on one of the elevations, and I'm mindful of policy D24 regarding light pollution. And I was wondering whether we can condition anything on light pollution, please. Address that, or Mrs. DeVries, or was I offline? Okay. Um, in terms of light pollution, um, what we could do potentially is maybe require a filter over the windows, but usually you'd expect some sort of um, sort of breeze soleil to stop upward light. That's not shown as part of the design, and how enforceable it is depending on what they put in um, might be a bit questionable. So we'd have to have details submitted to officers for approval. Um, and then see where we go with that in terms of construction costs. Yes, please. Moving the recommendation, but with a an, an additional condition relating to information to be submitted to planning officers in advance in relation to light uh, control of light coming from the building. Please. word up such a condition with with Mr Evans okay any further comments or questions we've got Councillor Facey I think next thank you chairman I've, Bill's obviously one step ahead of me on that one I was just looking at the uh, some of the lights on the top of it I actually do really admire the design chairman and I'm quite happy to second Bill's recommendation with the bits and pieces Councillor Bill Revens, RN. I won't tell you what the RN stands for. I'm working out. <laughs> working out yourself, Chairman. Okay. Any further comments or questions? We've, if not, we've got the proposal that has been to grant permission with the additional condition relating to control of light, um, to be a wording of which to be agreed, I guess, with Chairman and Vice Chairman. Mrs. Debris. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lehman. You're happy with that? So, members, you have the recommendation before you then to grant permission subject to that one condition, extra condition. Those in favour, please show. That looks to me unanimous. That's unanimous, Chairman. Yeah, that's clearly carried. So, permission granted. Right, members, if you can turn back in your papers to page 93 and uh, Brent Knoll. And we have Miss Parsons. I think you're going to present this one, please. Thank you, Chairman. Right, I think we're there. Um, this is an application for the change of use of land from agriculture to form an extension to an existing caravan park for the siting of static um, caravans and timber chalets together with the formation of a fishing lake. The the location is Westbrook Farm, which is to the east of the M5, as you can see the, the main junction roundabout there. Um, it's approximately um, a mile from the built up residential area of Brent Knoll to the west. The, the context in terms of the aerial, you can see um, it's located in outside of any settlement boundary. I'm going to come back to that one. Um, and you've got a site that's already established for a caravan park. There is an existing access into the site here. Um, there is a lot of history on this site and there's a lot of information on the agenda in terms of the applications together with um, some of the appeal applications. But I shall um, hopefully be able to make it clear for members. So there is an existing dwelling here. Um, there is land that's consented for storage of caravans in this location. And then these two pockets of land have been consented for touring, touring caravans. So this application relates to this area. I'll run through some photographs so that I can give you further context. This photograph is taken from this point here and looking along the road, along Hart Road, to the site area, which is within this field. 
this is at that gateway at the same point at that corner adjacent to the road and the field looking across to the west and this is the current boundary of the touring caravan park and this proposal to convert or change the use of this land would incorporate an access through this hedge to the um, existing caravan park. Um, this is looking along the boundary, the southeastern boundary of the site and the site boundary further afield with the Mendips in the distance. And at the same spot, really looking alongside the other depth direction to the, towards the east to the neighbouring land and the neighbour neighbouring um, boundary. In terms of the history, before I show you the proposal, in terms of the history of the site, um, as I said, a number of applications have been submitted. Now, the, an application was submitted in 2018 to use this area of land. Um, that was refused for three reasons that are on page 93 of, of the report. Um, one reason relating to inappropriate expansion of the site due to its size. Second, the impact on the character of the area. And the third, that there were inadequate means of um, foul and surface water drainage. Subsequently, um, a further application was submitted. That was refused for three similar reasons. Um, it was almost identical, slightly different in terms of the number of statics and mobile, I mean, chalets. Um, that was refused, as I said, by uh, Sedgemoor for three similar reasons. That went to appeal. The, um, at, at the appeal, the inspector stated that he had no objection in terms of the impact of the development on the character of the area nor the impact on flood risk, but he considered that adequate justification needed to be provided under the terms of policy D17, the tourism policy. So um, subsequently, this current application before you now has been submitted. It's identical to the previous application that was dismissed at appeal um, for the only reason um, regarding lack of justification. So this proposal is for 47 static caravans and nine timber chalets. The roadway would run along this boundary here and it would be linked into the existing touring site via this access here. The rectangles that you can see around the site, those are the static units and then the pond or the lake within the site with the timber chalets um, dotted around the site. Now, in terms of the principle of the development, the site is outside of any settlement boundary and therefore in the countryside. The proposal seeks to change the use of a large field adjacent to the established touring park to create a significantly larger tourism scheme. Now, while the number of units may be a significant addition to the existing site, the planning inspectorate during its consideration of the previous application did not consider that this would cause any adverse impact in terms of scale or character. The um, a business plan, a business plan has been submitted in support of this proposal, which was a vital piece of information that was missing from the previous applications, which were dis dismissed as appeal. It's considered that the business plan demonstrates appropriate investment and growth. The expansion of the site could result in economic growth for the business through the provision of additional statics and timber chalets, which would also provide a positive diversification from the current nature and scale of the business. The proposal would result in an increase to an existing tourism business, and it is considered that the principle of diversification and extension of the existing site is accepted and has been justified adequately in terms of the proposed size, scale and layout, and therefore accords with the tourism policy D17. In terms of impact on the character of the area, the site, as I said, is located in a countryside location, and the adjacent land has already been partly developed for tourism use. The proposal comprises of an expansion to the existing, existing tourism facility, which would more than double the site area. However, during the inspector's appeal decision, he's, he concluded that the proposal would have an acceptable effect 
on the character and appearance of the area and that it would accord with the relevant aims of policies D2 and D19 of the local plan, the D2 being the design and D19 the landscape policies. On balance, therefore, it's considered that subject to an appropriate mitigating landscape scheme, the development would have no undue adverse impact on the character of the area and would accord with the policies D2 and D19. In terms of impact on drainage and flood risk, Again, this site is located within flood zone 3A and the use of the land for caravans and cabins is classed as a more vulnerable use within government's guidance. And therefore, it's necessary for sequential tests, exceptions tests to be passed. The, um, the application has been supported by an exceptions, sequential and flood risk assessment. For the purposes of the sequential test, the area of search is to be central district area unless it can be demonstrated that the development has a specific locational requirement based on functional requirements or to meet a demonstrable specific local need, in which case the area of search should reflect this. In this case, it's considered that due to the locational and functional requirements of the service requirements of the existing tourism facility, the area of search for the sequential test can be refined to the boundaries of the site. It's therefore considered that the sequential test is passed due to this forming an extension to the established business. And with regard to the exceptions test, the site specific flood risk assessment is considered to be adequate. And the Environment Agency have no objection provided the development is carried out in accordance with that flood risk assessment. In terms of impact on highway safety, the proposal seeks to expand the tourism site However, the existing access would be utilised to gain access into the field. There is adequate parking and turning facilities within the site and the access onto the public highway has adequate level of visibility to serve the proposed use. In conclusion, the development is considered to be appropriately justified to warrant exception to development in a countryside location and it would promote economic activity without resulting in an adverse impact on the character of the area, highway safety or flood risk. And therefore the recommendation is to grant consent. Can I please make an adjustment to, um, if, if the application is approved, to the recommended condition number five, which relates to lighting um, in respect of bats. I suggest that um, we incorporate wording to safeguard against general light pollution um, and for the wording to be agreed with the chair and vice chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Yes, Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, the entrance to the new site presumably is separate to the one that was um, granted for the new dwelling. Otherwise, you can have two entrances side by side. Shanta, do you want to uh, comment? Thank you, Chairman. Um, actually, the, I mean this is the this is the proposed site into the um, development. Sorry, this is the proposed site into the development, um, which has been used for many years to gain access to the wider site as a whole. Um, I'm not in. I wasn't aware that this dwelling had a separate access, but I could. I can check that in a moment. But this site would be incorporated to gain access into this field, which is the same access that leads into the entire caravan park. Um, I'll just need to double check the details for the dwelling, the replacement dwelling, if you have an understanding that that might be via different access. Certainly give you a bit of an update on that. If, if you can keep that plan on yeah. the, for the moment. Currently, the, the the former property that used to be there did share the access with the the caravan park. When the when the house was given permission to be replaced, there is a new access that is being created. As you look at that plan to the far left of the the site, just before it goes off off the plan, so there is a separate a, a new access that has been given permission, which will service the the residential property separate from the commercial, which will all go through the one other entrance. Do a new dwelling hasn't been formed, has it? Has not been formed yet, but it has got permission to be formed. The other thing was highways comments. I mean, so you're going to have 
if this is granted today, rather a, an excessive number of vehicles joining the A38 by the Fox and Goose, which is already a very busy access with traffic. Counties seem to be happy with this proposal. Yeah, Miss Parsons, do you want to just comment on the highways access getting onto the F38 and, and county highways? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, in the report, the County Highways Authority um, acknowledged the site and they, they're not objecting to the application. They have had additional information provided as part of the processing of the planning application and they have commented and they raised no objection, as you can see in their comments in the agenda. Thank you. Join a busy road when they leave or when the I'm saying even that junction when they're arriving, they've got to cross the A38, which for normal people is bad enough. No, the junction. OK, any other comments or questions? I've got Councillor Grimes and then Councillor Perry. Could you pass? Councillor Grimes, thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me OK? Oh, thank you. Um, site seems well run, very tidy. There are other sites on this road um, and the interest of tourism in this area, I believe all the boxes have now been ticked um, and there's no outstanding issues where that's concerned. And I think it's probably be a very good asset to the area. And um, with that in mind, I'm happy to move the recommendation with any conditions that um, the officer deems fit. Thank you, Chairman. A quick question about um, the number of uh, uh, static caravans and the site being used like a construction site in the beginning. Is the road um, okay for all that construction to go ahead? Answer that one, please. Um, well, thank you, Chairman. I've, I've. I mean, in terms of the proposal, the Highways Authority have commented, as as I have quoted in the agenda, and it's, they are not objecting to the proposal. So I can only say yes, it must be an acceptable road to serve that that nature of traffic. Thank you. That's, that's seconded by Councillor Perry. Um, seeing any further comments or questions? In which case, then we have a recommendation that's been moved and seconded to grant permission, subject to the amended condition as outlined by Miss Parsons. All those in favour of that, please show. Would appear to be unanimous again. Yes, unanimous again. <laughs> Thank you very much. So clearly carried. Members, if you can turn to the next application, where uh, which is on page 124. So we move back to within the parish of Burnham and Highbridge. And I believe, Mr. Tate, you're presenting this one for us. Uh, yes, Chairman, I'll just bring up the uh, slides. OK, hopefully. OK, can everyone see the slides? Yes, please go ahead. OK, um, this is an application to um, remove a, a Monterey Cypress tree that's in um, the uh, holiday village. The location um, is pretty much in the middle of the um, of the slide here. Most of the um, there's an area tree preservation order covering about 50% of the holiday village. The reason for the application is. is the, um, sorry, there's a strange bit of feedback there um, is root damage to the uh, one of the adjoining caravans. 
Um, the first, the, the photographs here show the location of the tree and you can see actually how um, wooded the actual um, park is. Um, the, 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 the first slide shows the, the main access road um, to part of the, uh, the, the caravan site and you can start to see the cracks appearing across the hard standing. Um, the second slide shows very clearly the cracks um, from the roots which have spread actually from the tree across the hard standing and are also now have extended underneath um, the caravan, one of the caravan immediate in the immediate vicinity. Um, this shows in a little bit more detail and I'd have to say having visited the site with the landscape officer, um, what isn't apparent even from photographs is the height that the, um, the, the root damage is causing is probably um, at least seven and a half, maybe towards 10 centimeters high. It now represents quite a significant um, trip hazard in terms of health and safety. And you're starting to see as well, as I say, the roots are now um, have extended underneath the hard standing for the um, mobile home. This again shows in a little bit more detail the extent of the damage right across the hard standing and just slightly to the to the rear of the photograph, a second route which is now spread underneath the, uh, the, the static caravan. And the photograph on the right does show the very close proximity of the tree now to the um, to the caravan and indeed the, 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 the hard standing space there. Having visited the landscape officer, uh, I was on the site visit with the landscape officer. Um, in terms of being able to take remedial action, the only solution would be ultimately to remove the, the, the roots, um, dig out the hard standing, remove the roots and relay them. That wouldn't in itself address the issue of the roots now causing damage to the actual sort of foundations on which the caravan is sitting on. And the concern is if these main roots were removed, that actually that would unbalance the tree um, and would, which would start to be prone to, to dying back and become unsafe in itself. I mean, fundamentally, the caravan and the tree are in too close proximity. And over the years, the size of the tree has now, has, as you can see, has got very large and, and dominates and over the um, hard standing and of the caravan itself. There are a large number of trees around the existing green area and the recommendation is therefore to actually to remove this large Monterey Cypress and there would be a replacement tree planted further, a little bit further away from the caravan and a more appropriate species um, which would not be subject to such vigorous growth in that, uh, in that area. In terms of uh, the, the wider amenity, as you can see, it's heavily heavily wooded. There are trees along the main entrance. Um, there are not long distance views of this tree in itself. And so overall, the, the consideration is that it wouldn't have a detrimental um, impact on the overall sort of amenity of the, of the park there. It is always disappointing. Removing of a tree is always a last resort, but on it on inspection, the existing damage is now representing a very significant health and safety issue in terms of, of, of trip hazard and is starting to undermine the foundations of, of, of the caravan. Um, and as, as in looking at other considerations, we can see no suitable alternative um, that would remediate the, those existing problems. So thank you and happy to try and answer any questions. Uh, I've got a couple of councillors who've indicated, Councillor Hendry and then Councillor Revens. So if we start with Councillor Hendry. Chairman, I agree with everything the case officer said, absolutely. A situation like this only worsens it and never ever gets better. Uh, there's a place called Manor Gardens in Burnham which has this exact same problem. And over the last few years, it's, this situation is terrible. All the paths are broken up around the trees. This situation in particular here, the road, the approach road, which is next to it, will suffer greatly if this tree is not dealt with. And the way I see it too is there is no alternative to have the tree removed, given there's a load more trees round about it anyway, and they said they will replant a tree to replace it. But yes, this, this tree unfortunately has to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Revens. <coughs> Um, 
thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm just um, just curious to understand whether any consideration has been given to moving the caravan rather than moving the tree. Uh, has there been any comment in terms of the merits of moving the van rather than the tree? I, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean starting point is we're dealing with the application in in front of us but in terms of um finding an alternative pitch um it is privately owned um it's a bit like saying you know it's consideration being given to someone moving their moving their, their their property there aren't spare pitches in that in that actual area um and as I said at the end of the day um that that pitch, which is that, that that caravan, which is privately owned, you know, has an entire you know, has has a right to to be there. And in terms of the expense of trying to find a relocation, even if the um even if the owners were um were acceptable of that, it's not obvious where an alternative um, pitch could be found within the existing park. So it's not a realistic option. Um, if we were planning this from the start. It, it, I think it demonstrates the importance when we're looking at developments where we are very careful about proximity of development to um, existing trees um, for just this, this sort of issue. But this is a historic situation which we have to deal with. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? I've got Councillor Hendry and then Councillor Kingham. Councillor Hendry. The problem is not the caravan or the site of the caravan. That's not even an issue, to be honest. The, the problem is the damage caused by the roots. And at the moment, it's, it's quite minimal. But over the next two, three, four, five years, that will become very substantial because they always do. So I can't see the caravan is not a problem. It's just it's not in the picture. In actual fact, it's, it's the roots of the tree that will eventually become overgrown and cause terrible problems. So I still stand by. I think the tree has to go. Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Chairman. I think it's a shame when any any tree has to be uh, removed, but uh, I think in this case, I think it's something that uh, has to be done. And can we uh, have a replacement of a mature tree rather than a, a sapling, which is going to take years to grow? Thank you, Mr. Tate. I think with the conditions, it's it's for a standard size tree, so it's not a it's not going to be a whip. It's it's a a, a semi mature tree. Yes, yes, and and that will be agreed with. Um, the, the landscape officer um, and we are in a situation where we have got quite extensive existing you know remaining trees in that that, that area um, but I, I think it would be hard to justify a fully fully mature tree but as 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 has pointed out you know we're not talking about a a, 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 a sort of a whip which take many years to become established and we'd also agree what is appropriate Matt in that area in terms of you know, scale and some so that this issue doesn't you know come about in the future thank you very much if there's no further comments or questions i'm going to look for a proposal councillor hendry <laughs> slow down slow down <laughs> I, I feel quite strongly about this and the forthcoming damage it could be caused. So on that basis, I'm happy to move the recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Councillor Hendry, yes, I will second the recommendation. Seeing any other comments or questions. So we have the proposal that's been moved and second to grant permission for the removal of tree and replacement with a, and a more appropriate one. Those in favour, please show. Okay, we got eight. Sorry, can we just show again? Please? With those in favour, please show again. Yep. And those against, please show. And any abstentions, please? Five. Yep, so that is clearly carried. There were eight in favour, no against, and five abstentions. Yeah, yep. that's correct. Thank you very much. Right, members, if you turn to the next application is on page 127. And we're joined by Mr. Titchener, I think, to present this one. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I'll just bring the uh, presentation up. 
we can we can hear you, Dean. So uh, stop when you're ready. Okay. Can you see the presentation? <laughs> yes, we can. Excellent. Right. Okay. So um, the application is for the change of use of uh, land from agricultural to uh, garden. It's a property. Um, called uh, Mysey Day at Vensgate uh, Cheddar. Um, some members may be familiar with the site because previous applications um, have come at this site have come to committee. Just click through. Okay, so just to locate ourselves, we're up in sort of the northwestern edge of Cheddar, so just off of, sort of Vensgate uh, here, uh, the existing property of. Uh, Mysey Day is uh, located here. The um, plot here, uh, this rectangular plot, is where uh, previous permission for a self-build dwelling has been granted. The plot of land that is looking to be added to that to form part of its res residential garden is uh, this very sort of northern uh, edge of this uh, uh, long field located here. Um, so this plan shows in a little bit more detail the existing property um, uh, here. This is the rectangular plot that's been consented for a self-built dwelling uh, and this is the plot of land that's to be added uh, to form it, uh, to, to extend the garden that's proposed to go with it. So it, just in terms of the block plan, so this is the um, dwelling as um, uh, as consented, so it came in originally as an outline. They've subsequently got their reserve matters consent, so that's the form of the dwelling. Uh, it's relatively large. That there is the existing hedgerow boundary that forms the current southern delineation of that plot. And this rectangular area on the south is the area that's to be added uh, to be formed as part of a large garden to serve that property. Um, uh, with a gap of about 2.8 metres formed in the hedgerow here to provide um, access into the into the larger area. Um, so these are pictures of the site. So they haven't started construction of the self-built dwelling uh, yet, uh, though I understand their intention to start uh, relatively uh, shortly. So we can look across the sort of uh, square site, see the existing uh, hedgerow boundaries that form the uh, current southern delineation here. So it's fairly mature hedgerow boundary and they're looking to just uh, form through uh, an opening uh, in this location here into the um, field um, beyond. These photos are taken from the very far end of the field to the very lower end of the field. This road here is the Axbridge Road, which leads up from, um, from Cheddar uh, up towards um, uh, magic roundabout sort of further up. Uh, so this is sort of stood uh, in, there's a little sort of pull in off the road here. Um, there's no pedestrian access to get here. So you would have to, you can only really get to it in a car. Um, there's no footways along Axbridge Road. So that brings you up to here where you can look up the long, um, the long field and to the site beyond. And this is sort of stood at the very bottom end of the field. So it's just that very northern end of, of, of the field um, uh, that would be affected by the application. So the proposal, as I stated, they've got planning permission for a self-build that's already been granted. Just in terms of some background, they actually came in after they got their first permission for a self-build, they then came in for an alternative scheme for two dwellings on the site as an outline. Um, they aren't proposing to progress that. They actually submitted, they would have been an either or scheme, so they were both on the same plots of land, so you couldn't do both. They kept, they've come in and had their reserve matters for the single outline approved. Um, and when that application came in uh, earlier this year, it included uh, this larger garden area that, that is part of this field in with uh, the scheme at that time. Um, on a sort of very technical note, we told them that they weren't able to do it as part of that reserve matter scheme because the reserve matter had to use the red line boundary that had been set at the outline stage. Um, so they couldn't do it under that, that application. It would have required a separate application of its own, which is why we've now got this application in front of us today. Um, so the proposal would see the area of the field, that sort of top rectangle, which measures 29 metres in width and about 11 metres in depth, changed its use to form part of the garden. They propose, in addition to the sort of the breaching of the existing hedgerow to form that 2.8 metre 
uh, gap uh, to plant new native hedgerow uh, as the means of delineating the new southern boundary um, of that uh, part of the garden. So overall, in terms of how do we look at these types of applications, it's not unusual that we get these sort of um, schemes where someone wants to uh, enlarge a garden, particularly on the edge of a you know a rural settlement, um, and they're primarily looked in terms and uh, assessed in terms of what the overall impact is on the character and appearance of the area. So policy D two is relevant. Landscape policies can be relevant. So proposed should enhance landscape quality, have no significant adverse impact on local character, and. Uh, Chair and neighbourhood plan also has policies which talks about relating to the local context, and reinforcing local character and distinctiveness, so sort of you know, very much similar themes to sort of the local plan policies. So in terms of making that assessment, as I've, as I've indicated from the photos, particularly the ones shown from the bottom end of the field, there's actually very limited vantage points where uh, views, inward views could be obtained of this uh, parcel of land. Um, it, you can see it from Vensgate, the road that runs along this Vensgate is a, a relatively, well, it is a narrow road, heavily vegetated boundaries along the roadside. So realistically, you're looking at viewpoints from the southern end, uh, so where the access to the field is. But as I stated, you can't get there on foot um, uh, without having to walk in, 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 the, in the road, and it's a relatively busy road. Um, uh, so you could drive there. Um, and even then you stood at the bottom end of the field looking up quite a long field. Um, so inward viewpoints are likely to be to be limited. Um, there aren't plans as proposed to, to remove the existing hedgerow, say for that, that forms that sort of existing boundary at the moment, say for the two point metre access. So over time, the new hedgerow will become established and mature. That will obviously take a few years. But so, so when you're looking from what limited vantage points there are, it's likely to have overall a relatively limited impact uh, on viewpoints and, and local character. The Mendip Hills area of outstanding natural beauty is to the north, so that's um, located on the northern side of Bensgate, so that designation starts there, but it's not anticipated that proposal is likely to have um, an impact on views to or from the OMB when, when taking into context you know, what limited viewpoints are, are inwards. Um, you know, it is going to be next to an adjoining adjo adjoining dwelling. That dwelling is going to be there. That's the dwelling itself is likely to be much more um, noticeable than than than, a, than this area of garden um, uh, that's likely to be associated with it. Now there are conditions proposed on the um, uh, 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 that are recommended to secure the replacement hedgerow planting, uh, so that that's planted. Uh, within a certain period following uh, no later than the sort of the um, the occupation of the of the dwelling that was approved on the other scheme. But subject to that, we've considered the scheme to be uh, policy compliant. Just in terms of amenity and some other factors, we'd always always look at. You know, policy D1025 is about not unacceptably impacting on the amenity of adjoining residents. Now, the nearest dwellings are those to the east and northeast, and but these are all these are in the applicant's control. There are third party dwellings, but they're at a further distance on the north side of Ben's Gate and further to the west, about 70, 75 metres to the west. So um, notwithstanding the fact that there are some near pro nearby properties, it's not the type of proposal that we would consider would give rise to unacceptable amenity impacts. It's a garden area. Um, the dwelling's already consented, so um, the garden itself is not particularly going to give rise to immediate concern. So in that respect, we consider it to be policy compliant. Just to touch on ecology, um, the, the dwelling that was consented was subject to a habitat regulations assessment in regards to the impact on bats because of the North Somerset and Mendip um, uh, special area of conservation. Um, and that in approval included conditions regarding protection of hedgerows, that's protection during the construction phase, and controls over lighting. Um, because of, because it was subject to a habitat regulations assessment, and obviously it's so close to this one, we sought the advice of the county ecologist. They confirmed that with the 2.8 metre breach of the hedgerow um, 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 and the new hedgerow, which overall they were considered would be a net gain, um, they were not they didn't feel there was a need to raise an objection they felt that no further habitat regulations assessment needed to be prepared and uh subject to the imposition of the condition that i've already mentioned about securing the, the new uh, hedgerow um they didn't have concerns didn't feel the need to object and overall therefore on ecology grounds it's also considered to be policy compliant so the recommendation is 
In terms of the visual landscape amenities and the ecological impacts, the proposal is considered to be acceptable, and therefore our recommendation is to grant permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? Councillor Revens. Uh, thank you very much. Two questions. Um, first of all, in terms of the existing hedgerow, I understand that 2.8 metres is being taken out. Is there anything that prevents them taking out the rest of it at a later date? And secondly, I noted with interest that there is outline planning permission for two um, dwellings on the site. The wording of this application seems to me to rule out the building of two later on. Is that your understanding as well? Uh, so just on the first point, I mean, I think it's relevant to raise, you know, what happens with the existing hedgerow that, that, that's there. Um, uh, there are, so it's a hedgerow that's um, uh, about 30 metres in length. So there are some controls that will, uh, that can that place limitations on removal of hedgerows. So there are the hedgerow regulations. If you want to take out a hedgerow that is more than 20 metres in length, you would, that would need to be subject to um, uh, the uh, removal under the hedgerow, the hedgerow regs. Um, in terms of, it is uh, more difficult to control uh, removal hedgerows otherwise in perpetuity because the only way to do it really is through a tree uh, preservation order and there are certain tests in terms of the quality of hedgerow that need to be um, that would need to be met for that to be done so that is more tricky um, there are controls uh, uh, on the um, the outline application for the one dwelling that means the hedgerow has to be retained uh, uh, and protected throughout the construction period. Though I accept the controls are, are more difficult on a longer term basis in terms of m maintaining any hedgerow. And that's the same that apply for any application anywhere that um, we would be almost falling back to the hedgerow regs where there's more than 20 metres to be removed. But if they wanted to remove a 20 metre section uh, or more than that, then the hedgerow regs in that case would kick in. In terms of the two dwelling scheme, um, they, they were sort of an alternative scheme. So they were on the same plot of land. So it, um, so the one dwelling scheme or the two dwellings. So if they build out the um, once they they effectively can't build both. It's a, it's an either or um, they wouldn't they, they're they, they have they've come in with a reserve matter um, uh, and stated their intention to build it and to and to occupy it themselves and are in discussions with us about the materials to go on it. So what, very much the indications are that's the scheme that they, that they wish to go for. Um, I don't foresee that there's any circumstance in which they would be able to deliver the second dwelling um, because the first dwelling is effectively going to going to preclude that. Thank you. Thank you. The start. How long is the existing hedge going to be once the 2.8 meters are taken out? So, sorry, was that a query about how long the hedgerow is? Um, hedgerows that are over 20 metres are protected. Yeah. I just want to find out how long the hedgerow is once you take the 2.8 metres out. It's um, it, it's in the order of about 25 metres. Give or take, it's more than 20. Machiavellian here, but if they take the 2.8 out partway along the hedge, are they then related as two separate hedges, which would both be less than 20 metres? I mean, the, two, the, the bit that's coming out is very much at the end. So the retained head, the, the remaining hedgerow is a long section of over 20 metres length. Any other questions? Yep, Councillor Kingham. Jim, to uh, Mr Tishner. Um, the parish council objected to say that it's outside of the development boundary. And surely something like this doesn't have boundaries because it's a field. Um, Councillor King, you're exactly right. I mean, um, any application of this nature is always going to involve agricultural land. That land is always going to be outside the settlement boundary. Uh, so yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. That's always going to be the case. questions I'm looking for a recommendation then please yeah. recommendation as it on the table thank you councillor Bolt that's seconded thank you very much 
if there's no further question, I'm not seeing any. So we've had the recommendation to uh, to grant permission, moved and seconded. Those in favour, please show. That would appear to be unanimous. That's unanimous, Chairman. Yep, so that's clearly carried, so permission granted. Right, members, that brings us to the end of the applications that we have, but if you could turn in your papers uh, to the reports, which are starting on page 152, and we have the planning of appeals received. I think, Mrs. DeRidge, you're going to take us through these. Just bear with me one second. Can everyone see that? Okay, thank you. So this is um, an appeal that's been received. It's application for prior approval for change of use of an agricultural building to a dwelling um, that's been refused planning permission, but it's with planning inspectorate currently. I'm not seeing any, so if we move to the second 7.2, which is appeals decided. for a HMO for up to nine people that was at committee. Um, it was refused uh, by members and it was dismissed as an appeal. So it's reverted back to enforcement for investigation. And there is discussion internally between ourselves and licensing, um, just trying to line advice that's going out, because if it might be appropriate licensing wise, that doesn't automatically mean it's appropriate for planning permission. Um, so we are trying to liaise with parties and then push it forward. Question from Councillor Granter. Yes, thank you, Chairman. One of my questions more even an answer, that's to really to the job of trying to say whether we get no reporting on it. I'm very pleased to see that so they're 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 in back on both in respect to whether it uh it was dismissed. I would possibly all work with Chairman. What happens Greg, you hold the mic a bit closer to the Sorry. Um, across all the different parties of the council and once there's progress to update I can bring it back to members as an update very helpful thank you I'm not seeing any other questions on that one, so I'll move to 7.3, which is the Certificate of Lawfulness. So certificate of Lawfulness submitted and granted for Stoneleys Hillside and Axbridge, which was um, for use as an existing dwelling. So they would have demonstrated they would have used it in excess of four years, and we granted the Lawful Development Certificate. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any questions on that one, so that, members, brings us to the the conclusion of today's uh, agenda. Can I thank you all very much for your participation? And can I also thank the, uh, the the guys from Canal Side who've been keeping us sorted in terms of video and uh, and also audio. So thank you very much. And we'll close the meeting. I've just seen Miss Lehman has just put camera on. Is that because you wanted to comment, Mr. Lehman? No, no, Chairman. I've got no comment to make. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Revens. run over this morning we may have needed to carry on this afternoon but we're we're finished so thank you very much thank you very much, <laughs> thank you very much. meeting closed thank you